Good evening, Ireland, and welcome to everyone wherever you are in the world. I'm Sandy Unown, author of Boats for Wind from Salmon Poetry, and co-host along with Dominic Taylor of the Limerick Writers' Center for this evening's A Night to Remember, a Titanic Irish Poetry Showcase. A commemoration of the 108th anniversary of White Star Line's RMS Titanic 1912 disaster. And also a celebration of International Poetry Month. On this date in 1912, the most famous ship in history collided with an iceberg on her maiden voyage at 11.40 p.m and sank in the cold North Atlantic at 2.20 a.m. on April 15th with a massive loss of life of 1,500 plus souls. Ireland has a storied, storied history with the Titanic. Titanic was built in Ireland in Belfast at the Harland and Wolfe shipyards and her last port of call was Queenstown, now Cove, where 123 passengers boarded on, on, that, on that day in April, on April 11th. Tonight's poets exemplify an extraordinary, extraordinary legacy. April is Poetry Month in Limerick, and when I learned of the Limerick Writers Centers cancellation of 35 plus events, in-person live events in Limerick. I reached out to Dominic Taylor to ask, would you like to use the Cultivating Voices live poetry open mic platform that my sister and I had started only just three weeks ago? He stepped up as he always does for poetry and within 24 hours we had the lineup of poets that you're about to hear from this evening or wherever you are in the world. It was a call for poets to unite, to unite now in April 2020 in the time of a new crisis. For as Muriel Rukeyser says, in time of crisis, we summon all our strength. I've found in these past few weeks that my strength is poetry, that poetry is all of our strength and our connection with each other through poetry is what helps us endure. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to, before I introduce Dominic from the Limerick Writers Center to introduce the rest of our um, Irish poets and our spectacular American Titanic poet who will close out this evening, Anna M. Evans. I'm just gonna read a few poems from my debut collection, Boats for Women, which first section has a deep, deep connection to the Titanic disaster of 1912. So this will be my Titanic set. And the first poem is called, A Night to Remember Your Beautiful Gone. Um, the title is taken from Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember, written in 1955, which was one of the first significant history books ever written about Titanic. And um, I'm doing a project of erasure poems from that book, where, and this is the first erasure poem. A Night to Remember Your Beautiful Gone, 14 April. 2017. And there were no more. Never again could the world fall apart, off duty, put to sea, outdated, an absurd capacity. This worked out. This meant she had to carry nobody. Even so, this, this took care of only everybody. The end of class denied anything of investigators, evidence that hundreds were kept crawling from ladders to escape. 
They were so hard to find. The statistics suggest casualty, not to mention the chance to be better but not perfect. Remembered at the gate, may we pass, they asked, no. In fairness, these distinct distinctions set policy, as if from no policy at all, barred the way, but didn't tell anyone, left to drift, enterprising, no one seemed neither anything, just proud of covering a rival. So here we've arrived together at this moment with Titanic and Ireland and, and all of our poets assembled. And um, this, this next poem, people often ask me, you know, why, why Titanic? You know, what's your obsession? And, and trust me, friends, it's an obsession. Um, well, one of the reasons is that my parents' wedding anniversary is also April 14th. Um, and so this poem is in honor to my parents, who I believe are watching out there. Um, today is their 57th wedding anniversary. And so myself, my sister Elizabeth Ann, my brother John, my sister-in-law Corinne, we all wish you lots of love and happy anniversary. And here's a poem that I wrote about that connection between the two. It's called Providence, April 14, 1998. When I call my parents to wish their marriage continued success, hear the Connecticut shore breaking in the background, I am thinking also of the ship, hoping that maybe on this April 14th, the Titanic doesn't hit the iceberg, that Captain Smith for once heeds the warnings of ice and doesn't give in to speed, that the lookouts have binoculars, that the Californian doesn't put its radio to sleep 10 minutes before the first distress call. But my mother isn't thinking about her anniversary or the iceberg when I call. She is thinking about Providence when she says she has something she wants to ask me, thinking about Providence before and after I hang up the Providence of last summer's love now ling lingering in my ears and all that week before spent convincing my mother that she was just a friend. But I was nervous at dinner, couldn't eat, on the drive to Providence, I grew tired and had to stop at the scenic overlook in Mystic, where the, in the dark I could just make out the shadows of the historic ships pressed against the night. In Providence, her plane was the last to land and late, pulling into its gate like the Carpathia arrived in New York alone and anticipated I sat in the airport with my head in my hands, afraid of whomever might not deplane. But when I looked up, she stood before me with her luggage in hand. And in the middle of the terminal, we held each other as survivors of what we did not yet know. So I've had the last year on April 14th, I actually was in Ireland and I was in Cove, which was Titanic's last port of call. Um, I was there for every year they have a commemoration ceremony. It was quite remarkable. And um, this next poem features um, Cove in that uh, Father Brown, who's mentioned here in the, in the, in the, in the poem, took a very, very famous series of photographs. And because he uh, disembarked in Cove, he went from Southampton to Cove, his uncle was the bishop in Cove, and his uncle said, get off that ship now. And so he stayed in Ireland, and as a result, we have a very famous series of photographs that commemorate and show us what life was like on board Titanic at the beginning of her maiden voyage. 
This poem is based on one of those photographs called an, of a boy with the top, and this poem is a sestina with a, a very obsessive repetition of words, and it's called The Boy with the Top, and it opens with this epigraph. All the values of life changed, and the daily incidents, which once were of such importance to us, dwindled into mere trivialities. Daisy Spedden, after the Titanic scene. Father Brown snaps the photograph of the boy at the top. Something about composition, how he rescues the father's stare at the boy, bending over the spinning top like water caught in a sink before rushing the drain. No teeth chatter in this picture. Every onlooker has his back to the camera, eyes on the top, while the boy's pull string snakes toward the deck. Later, in the lifeboats, some of these snakes of industry survive. Master Douglas's spedden leaves his top behind in first class, only remembers after he's back home in Tuxedo Park, where the family's camera stares this time at the space where he's lost a tooth, lost while he waited for some hand to pull him safe from the water, to name him forever survivor. I tell her I'm water, the element that guides such ships to safety, snakes to drier land, a long row of teeth to bite the shore. When I'm the boy on top, pressing my chest against hers, I stare straight into her eyes to help her turn back the clock before we slow to a stop my fingers back inside her, searching for the switch to close the watertight doors, but the water keeps climbing, climbing the stairs. To keep from drowning, my tongue will snake her skin, our hearts pushing toward their top speeds. I like to rush my teeth through her hair like the Titanic's sweet tooth for the iceberg. In three days, Master Douglas is back on vacation with his family in Maine. On the blacktop, he shoots marbles through a puddle of water, then a screech. The tire marks snake where the driver tries to swerve. The Model T stares down the boy the way the Titanic stared out into the chilly night. A Samaritan finds a tooth next to Master Douglas's hip, notes the boy's perfect snake charmer's grin as he floats dead on his back. The coroner does not know that Master Douglas has survived water before. And so for years, everything at the bottom has been top secret, the plates intact, the silver rings, the dye staring snake-eyed, pulled from the sand like teeth. I ask her to dive under water, to come back all wet, bearing the boy's missing top. So just two more. And um, you can imagine, um, my delight when I realized that a prior obsession of mine, which was Houdini, and the Titanic historically overlapped. Um, and this poem, so I have a, a, another series of poems in Boats for Women in the voice of Bess Houdini as she's grappling with him um, after he's passed. And this one tells the story of that collision between Houdini and Titanic. Bess Houdini reveals her secret to the modern world. His cruelest of all tricks, irreversible and no one knew, before all sleights of hand, knots slipping, lock picks under tongues. I remember the taste of metal in my mouth as I bent to kiss him with each death-defying act, 
how once the pick punctured the wall of my cheek and I bled. Sometimes he got a little out of hand, like the night he performed the water can in Philadelphia during the January freeze. The Bergdahl Brewing Company filled his cell with eight gallons of lager. He escaped, intoxicated, all boast, betting he could make the Titanic disappear. From his armchair, three months later, he read the evening headline to me in his confident drawl, all saved from Titanic after collision. His portrait, smiling, handcuffed in tuxedo and leg irons, propped next to him on the end table. The next day, I slipped out of the house, bought my own morning paper before he woke. The headlines still accused the iceberg, the grainy photographs of the lifeboats empty on white stars, piers 58 and 59. I stood on the street corner. I knew the full capacity of what he could take from this world and what he would not give back. So, um, Boats for Women is my debut poetry collection, and it's taken me 21 years to publication. I am so very, very grateful to Salmon Poetry in Ireland and to legendary editor Jesse Lenny for helping me have my own maiden voyage with this book. Um, that came out just last year, around this time. And the themes are silence, disaster, desire, and hope. And I always like to um, end on a poem that's more hopeful. The word, um, the word disaster actually means to turn away from the light. And for me, desire and ha hope is a turn back toward the star. Um, the book fuses the personal with the historical, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to end with the title poem from the collection, and um, talk and then before and then I'll introduce Dominic Taylor, who will introduce all our poets. So this is the title poem. Boats for Women. Yes, the boat sank. Yes, it broke into like a stereotypical heart. Before it could plummet to depths no one could measure. Until 70 years later, technology caught up and looked its ancestor in the face. Yes, is the way the years oxidize the steel and yes wipes the name Titanic off the bow. Yes are the life of the Davids, the call for women and children first. Yes are the men who cry from the decks. Sometimes when I kiss her, I am leaving a yes on her lips to let her know I will go down with the ship. Sometimes when she whispers, yes, we are staying on board. But there is always room in the lifeboats for two more women. Yes is the fact that if we were alive on that night, we would have lived. The poem, Boats for Women, also comes from, the title comes from, political cartoon from 1912 of a suffragette standing with <coughs> up in the lifeboat with her sash that instead of saying votes for women said boats for women. Again, we're, we're in the year of the anniversary of that historical event and I just wanted to make reference to that. Well friends, my time is up and I am so excited to Raise a glass to all the poets coming up and welcome 
Dominic Taylor to Cultivating Voice, live open mic. And thank you to all the poets coming up, all the Irish poets and our American Titanic Consort of Sonnets, Anna M. Evans. Enjoy the evening, enjoy the poetry, be well, stay safe, and keep writing. Cheers until we meet again. Thank you so much, friends. We're so privileged to be able to gather in moments like this when so much of the world is plunged in darkness and chaos. So, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. Uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you Sandy on behalf of myself and the Limerick Writers Centre for the opportunity to take part in this unique celebration of poetry and I'd also like to thank uh, Elizabeth Ann there for all the tech support during the week. You may have heard there at the beginning in the background the voice of Leonard Cohen reminding us that the world has once again been plunged into darkness and chaos and to ring the bells that can still ring. Well, I'm delighted to introduce one of those bells tonight that, you can st that, that can still rescue us and bring comfort to us in times of trouble, and that is poetry. In times of trouble and celebration, poetry continues to be, uh, as Sandy alluded to earlier on in her introduction, the emotional response of our culture. And this evening, we bring you 10 Irish poets, the majority of whom have a connection with Limerick and the work of the Limerick Writers' Centre. Indeed, many of them have had collections of poetry published through our community publishing program, uh, Revival Press. We are also delighted to welcome a US poet from New Jersey, Anne M. Evans, who will wrap up the, re the reading at the end. Now, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with us, the Limerick Writers Centre is a not-for-profit literary organisation established in 2008 to support and nurture emerging and established writers in the Limerick region. Now we do this in many ways, through workshops, peer critique groups, public readings, book publishing, and a major plank of our activities has been two festivals we organize every year. April is Poetry Month in Limerick and the Bring Your Limericks to Limerick Festival, which is based upon the famous five line poem known worldwide as a Limerick. Unfortunately, as Sandy mentioned earlier on, just like other event organisers worldwide, we've had to cancel our Aprilist Poetry Month in, uh, in Limerick Festival for this year. But despite this, we are determined to carry on. And this evening's event is one of the ways for us to ensure that we can still support and encourage our local poets and writers. And so on to uh, this evening's readers. I'm going to give you a brief resume of them and how it and uh, now because it won't be possible for me to to introduce them as they are scheduled throughout the throughout the evening. Uh, first up uh, this evening is uh, Attracta Fahi, who appropriately enough in these times has a background in nursing and social care and hails from County Galway. Her poems have been published in many magazines and journals at home and abroad. And she has recently published a chapbook of her work called Dinner in the Fields from Fly on the Wall Press. And may I say as well that if you want to get some more background information on the poets, um, go to the event page for this event and uh, there's, there's a more detailed explanation for each of the poets. After Attracta, we welcome the first of our Limerick poets, Kieran Bevel. Kieran is one of our revival press poets whose collection of poems Fool's Gold was published in November 2019. He is a former teacher of English literature and the author of 17 non-fiction books, plus a very successful guide to creative writing, right now a practical guide to creative writing. As well as writing poetry, he plays guitar and paints. Following on from Kieran is Francis Browner, another Revival Press poet. Francis, Francis has, be, has many connections with Limerick, not least being her father was born here. She grew up in Dublin, lived in New York for 20 years, and now resides in Greystowns, County Wicklow. Her poetry is featured in many journals, and she's had short stories and memoir pieces published and broadcast on radio. 
She also runs the monthly Poets Parlour open mic in Greystones. Her debut collection, Roots and Wings, was published in December 2019 by Revival Press. Next up is our own Ron Carey, award-winning poet and one of our creative writing course tutors. Ron has been an inspiration to our writers here in Limerick, having come to writing seriously since he retired from full-time work. Since then, he has been a prize winner and finalist in many international poetry competitions and was shortlisted in 2016 for his debut collection, Distance, from Revival Press, for the former prize for his debut collection. One of the most prestigious poetry prizes in the UK and Ireland, Ron, born and raised in Limerick, currently lives in Dublin. Coming up to the halfway mark, I'm delighted to introduce you Limerick author and poet Edward O'Dwyer. Edward has had two collections of poetry published from Salmon Poetry and indeed is a stablemate of Sandy, who also publishes with the County Clare publisher. Edward is currently working on a third collection, uh, Exquisite Prisons. He has been shortlisted for a Hennessy Award and taken part in Poetry Ireland's introduction series. His poem, The Whole History of Dancing, won the Eggshire Michael Hartnett Festival 2018 Best Original Poem Prize. He also writes fiction. Now to one of our most recent recruits to Poetry and Limerick, and who came through the creative writing courses run by Ron Carey, Marie Studer. Marie is originally from Nina, County Tipperary, and now lives in Castle Connell, County Limerick. She is a graduate of the University of Limerick, BA in Comparative Literature, History and Sociology, and works in the voluntary sector. Next up, Arthur Broomfield. Arthur is a prize-winning poet and Beckett Scholar of Repute. Cold Coffee at Emo Court from Revival Press was a best-selling poetry collection in 2018. His seminal study on the works of Samuel Beckett, The Empty Two, Language and Philosophy in the Works of Samuel Beckett, Cambridge Scholars Publishing, is an acknowledged influence on the higher echelons of Beckettian research. The Giant Footsteps at the Rock of Dunamays, published by Revival Press in October 2019, is his follow-up collection to the best-selling Cold Coffee at Emu Court. Another County Tipperary poet, Michael Jurek, is up next. Michael was educated at Nina CBS and UCD and worked as a teacher for 36 years. His work has been published in many journals and his memoir in prose and poems, Saved to Memory, Lost to View, was issued in 2016. And in September 2017, his first poetry collection, Where It Began, published by, was published by Revival Press. With his brother Austin, they have produced two CD albums, The Secret Chord and Going Gone. Michael now lives in Ballina, County Tipperary. Our next poet up is Tommy Collins. He is another Limerick poet who has come through the many open mics that take place in Limerick. He is a teacher and has poems published in many journals and magazines. He is currently working on his debut collection. Our penultimate poet and last of the Irish poets is Eileen Sheehan from Killarney, County Kerry. Eileen has read her poems at many festivals in Ireland and abroad. She has had three collections of poet, po poetry published, including The Narrow Way of so Souls from Salmon Poetry, a collaboration with Japanese poet and academic Mackie Starfield, Duet of Lakes, is forthcoming from Junpa Books. Now, to wrap up the reading, we welcome poet and translator Anna M. Evans from New Jersey, who will read some poems on our team this evening, The Titanic. Among her many publications is Under Dark Waters, Surviving the Titanic, Abel Muse Press 2018. Her poems have appeared in many journals and she is currently teaching at Rowan College and directs the Poetry by the Sea Conference at Madison in Connecticut. That then is our exciting lineup for the evening's programme. I hope you enjoy it and I'm really looking forward to hearing all the poets. If, as I said, if you need any more information on their biogs and their backgrounds, go to the event page for this event. And if you enjoy our poets, poets' offerings and would like to experience more of their work, go to our website www.limerickwritercentre.com for revival press books and to www.salmonpoetry.com for salmon poetry books. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Attracta Fahi, Fahi in Galway for the first reading. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank, I want to thank Sandy and uh, Elizabeth Ann for inviting me to be part of this wonderful celebration of the Titanic. And um, 
it, and just to be part of this whole group I've, I've really enjoyed listening to other poets and um, hearing from poets I, I didn't I hadn't heard before there's a wonderful variety of poetry and such superb quality um, I want to thank Dominic for um, his introduction and um, lovely introduction and um, I want to thank you Sandy for a beautiful reading it was lovely to listen to um, your poetry again I listened I was at your reading in the museum in Galway um, and it was a wonderful wonderful reading so I'm very nervous now so stay with me the readings I'm going to do this evening is um, I don't have I'm going to cover two themes I want to um, read some poetry from my chapbook collection um, Dinner in the Fields by Fly on the Wall Poetry Press and I want to um, also read um, maybe just a few poems as a tribute to my friend Robbie and uh, my son's friend Robbie who became a friend of my family myself and my other two children uh, who died from Covid on Saturday. So I didn't have any poem on the Titanic um, but what I thought I'd do is read a few poems from my chapbook um, that in some way connect to the Titanic in that I suppose we all grew up with stories about the Titanic. We we knew it inside us, you know, there was it was like um it's like Noah, you know. Um and I think it I'm I'm reading poetry that relates to the land the, the immigrants left. I think that's what I thought I'd um how I'd make that connection in the sense of um I doubt if there's any family in Ireland that didn't have people who um immigrated. And my sister did um some work on the family history, um, the family tree with ancestry a few years ago, and I was amazed to discover, on all sides of my family, how many had immigrated. I would have known of having relations in America, and um, we'll say my father's um my um maternal grandmother, I would have there was twelve in the family, and I didn't realize eight of them immigrated. I thought there was just two because they were all we'd really heard of. And uh, it turns out there were eight. And then in my mother's paternal, um, the Hussey family, um, this is the extraordinary thing, the link to the Titanic. I mean, we didn't have anyone that died in the, the Titanic, but um, his three sisters immigrated and they never came back. And one of them travelled eight days before the ti Titanic sunk. And then um, two more travelled afterwards but one was on the 5th of May less than three weeks and I had reflected I've been reflecting you know um on this when I was reading some of the family history on how there's no record of how she met she was 19 years old she met her journey to Queensland in, in um what's now Cove and Cork and I didn't I wondered how she got there and made that great journey to you know and landed in Ellis Island so this was a wonderful um this was, it was amazing because she was only 19 and um, and she subsequently, two of her children, two of her sons died in the Second World War. It was interesting, she married an Irishman. And at one point I, from reading, I realised that I would have 16 cousins between all these three sisters. I would have 16 cousins in New York, but I never met any of them. We haven't been able to make that connection. And uh, she married an Irishman, as did her other two sisters. And... Um, they their children fought for America in, in the Second World War. We, we don't know where they died. We, there's just a record of their deaths. Um, so they were in the army. So what I what I wanted to focus on was the the land they left because sometimes, you know, Amer you know Americans come here and they try to connect with the land their their parents left, but they were our our part of our ancestors too. <clears throat> so I grew up in a farm in a place called Kilowairden and I was surrounded by, you know, graveyards and there was one 17th century graveyard and 17th century church. It was just so much of that old world where I where I came from. And um, this is the land they left. And I thought I'd read a poem called Vigil. I'd start with a poem called Vigil from that because I think that's our connection to um uh, as a child i thought all my ancestors are buried in this graveyard because obviously my ancestors are buried in the graveyard what i didn't know was that 
many of my ancestors were actually gone to America. That even though you knew you had relations in America, it didn't register. And it was just when I was reading through the family tree, most of the ancestors actually are buried in America. In my father's side, there are five sisters buried in one graveyard in Boston because they were all housemates and they stayed loyal to the families they were working for. And they're all buried there in Boston. Others died. Um, three of my granduncles died working on the docks in New York. And some arrived in Boston, some arrived in Ellis Island. So this is the land they left, and this is called Vigil. <clears throat> and it's really me walking through the parish that once was. And at the end of it, I call out the name of my ancestors, these people. Vigil. I walk to my parish over the five fairy forts climb church stiles that once led believers to mass, four paths through fields to the 17th century church, hidden amongst overgrowth, bramble, briar, whitethorn and clump, only faint outlines of stone hidden in room, times watermark. Speaking in silence, walls tell of our history, famine, Eviction, immigration, TB. This parochial fold lived dutifully despite hard times. Entombed in sacred grass, they will us to learn their lost history. Complete the work, theirs and ours. I imagined her fires, safety from the cold of fear and pillage. Recall stories of survival and defence. Now fertile fields, field, race field, then on to the road my forefathers trod to the old school. The only heat, sods carried each day past the red pump. Past the red pump, once important, decorative now. I see the clods and marks of cottages that once housed people I knew. They have left the storytellers, all dead. I call out again to the people I knew. Raftery, Flanagan, O'Keefe, Huzzy, Wen, Melody. Thank you. And the next poem I'm going to read is from that graveyard again. And it's about, you know, what I used to do as a child. I love scraping niching off the, <coughs> the sorry, the tombstones. So I call this poem Etchings, and it's the 17th century graveyard again. And this would be where my ancestors are buried. Etchings. There would be no miracles in a graveyard amongst the dead. Little happens in the quiet presence of departed souls. Our 17th century graveyard cradled our house, became my home. Tall slabs like brothers guarded tombs. Tiny wildflowers Buttercups in old grass, a welcome colour to the dead. At least spirits listened. Tension cannot hear. It cannot bear even its own silence. Spirits heard without ever a word. Fumbled walls of stone reveal their bones, holding slabs and words of an ancient tongue. The intricate letters, hidden names, once carved with grace, now corroded beneath the slitching. Slipping little fingers through each line, clearing moss, powdered lime, a child traced slowly into life, etchings. And the other one I'll read is again related to the graveyard and I'm choosing these this evening because, as I said, they relate to the world and the land that our immigrants left. Our sleeping women, it's called, and it's for my ancestral mothers. <coughs> Sorry, no. Our sleeping women. I think of my grandmothers, their faces etched in mine. Their strength sleeps in my bones. We meet in fields of crows. Their voices speak through wind. Old graves slope down from our farm. As a child, I played house, tea sets on tombs, innocent listening to spirits. 
daughters left to work with duty not to themselves, but to others who cared little for the objects they'd become. From the clay they cry the song of the crone, dreams of the life unlived. Hope moves in the soil beneath my feet, rises in my breath. They call, willing me on with their work. Don't listen to scavengers who have taken your use, your fear ripping, their fear ripping your pleasure. Scream yourself into your body. Starve if you need until you're hurt. Your face ours. Your, your face ours, your womb creator. The only real home yourself. And that's from my book, um, chapbook, Dinner in the Fields, if anybody would like to buy it. And um, I'm trying to watch the time here now. <coughs> I have another one. And it's um, called I Didn't Know My Father's Father which would be my grandfather and it would be some of his family who emigrated. I didn't know my father's father, but I knew his plough. Its remains leaned into the wall at the side of our barn, years growing in on itself. I imagine it's still there, a dulled brown monument resting on grass. My granduncle had a horse plough, sat on its high seat like a king as he cultivated fields later parked in the outhouse. My father owned a hand plough, kept in the shed. I watched him oil and grease, preserved all year in preparation for spring. I still see the sharp sting of metallic glint in the sun, twist in its knife-edged double blades, curled, shaped into feminine curves, like a proud, strong woman. I see him steer, his hands clasped on the bars, his father's hands on his, making a fist on the handles, his teeth clenched as if biting stone, meticulous eye in exactitude looking ahead, as he cut line after line into the earth, slicing soil row after row, the taste of supple mud in his mouth, each slice falling smoothly left, creating a furrow. I could smell the clay in the air as he put his strength, focused his will on breaking the clogs, lumps, bumps, us with our spades clearing stones. I watched him battling in wobbles, sweat streaming his face, the power of a man working his plough, the wisdom of his fathers before him. Spring in the air, new light gave us life, Life too in the brambles that shelter the fields. The odd scurry of leaves. We knew there were rabbits nearby. Foxes hiding in rushes. Over our heads, a hood of crows picking chopped worms. Relieved to see they could reinvent. This was the way of our life. Like worms, growing new heads for each season. My father knew... Ground must be prepared. Every beginning is joined to the end. He knew from his father what gives duration. Gradual endurance. Taught me the ways, cycles, how to cultivate and reap. I learned from my father, my grandfather's wisdom. So that's that and my connection to um, the Titanic <clears throat> and um, I have a few minutes left now and I wanted to read some poems. This is a poem I wrote a year ago when I visited my friend Robbie and I think I knew, it was a bit prophetic, I think I knew that I probably wouldn't see Robbie again other than on FaceTime. So Robbie died just last Saturday and from COVID and um, I wrote this poem as I was visiting. He lived in um, Central Park West. <coughs> Sorry. I'll take a drink of water and it's call up and bring a latte. This will be published um as soon as it's coming out and um with the blue nib. Um it should be next week. So it's published in that book. Call up and bring a latte. I feel the vibration of subway tremor through stone and wood. It's two beat rhythm in sync with my pulse. Words in my head. You can do it. You can do it. 
my heart shifts to three beats. Hear myself saying, yes, you can. No, you can't. I'm lost, afraid you'll forget me. I sit with my back to the park, under tree shade. Life free here, away from the world of noise, cars, horns, people absorbed in their own world, chasing to banks. This large space without changing the old leaves room for a new image where you're not forgotten and don't disappear in the crowd. Here we are in difficult times, in a garden of grace, taking what peace it offers, space for everyone, an inner world to reflect. I rest on the green bench, one street from Broadway, look across to your home, 25 Central Park West. Think of my visits, you at your desk, the window across your room, this park, its view stretched into skylight. I don't want to leave this moment, or you, not sure if or when I'll be back. The bench shakes under my feet, a theatre, another life. Am I the only listener? I sit back and wonder how many parallel lives pass as I wait for your message. Call up and bring a latte. <clears throat> and this next poem then is written for my son, Robbie, who was my son's friend. And um, they were very, very close. And my son had visited last year as well. And I just knew he, he had made a decision he was going to stay in America. So he was trying to tell me this and I had it picked up. And I don't know what conversation we had, but we walked the canal at the back in Newtown, Smith and Galway. And I wrote this poem afterwards. And in a way, this relates again to the Titanic because this is, this is the modern day immigration. And I knew he was gone. He's living in America now. And that's where he wants to make his home. <coughs> and it's called Walking the Canal. Your visit brief. We walk the canal. The sun at 30 degrees burns your face. Gulls screech Elijah. Their winged spirits carry off our thoughts. You left something with me when you changed your name. The child within, the boy who overcame sin, being gay. The river burbles, reflects light over invisible life. Sedge, bramble, hawthorn line the banks. The cathedral backdrop anchors us. You felt the silence that inhabits a home when children have grown. Our family table, table covered in books. You, my eldest, first to leave. Did you think the others would stay? Don't be afraid. The goddess of death is mild and in service of life. Look at the waterfall tumbling without concern. The old Corrug mood. How everything ends. Valerian spreads her pink all over the marsh. Mud settled on riverbed. Trusting herons move smoothly over the surface. I already knew you'd not be returning. With us, there is no separation. See how the terns stretch their necks, wings flapping over the sky. They too follow their destiny. My loneliness. I befriended her. There's nothing here to save. And I'm going to end on this poem that I wrote Sunday night, so... <clears throat> I don't know how it's going to sound. I just want to thank everybody. And it's, this is a lovely experience. My first time going live. Sorry about the, the hiccup in the beginning. And this is a song for... that Or a poem song. This po That poem, Walking the Canal, is for my son, Deacon. And that's Robbie's friend. And this is a poem for both of them. And it's taken as Deacon speaking to Robbie because he took care of him. He's a... And an anesthesiologist, if I can say it, in, in L.A. And he flew up. He was in ICU, worked several days and then flew up to be with um, Robbie. And so I'll just give you tell you before I start. Lois is Robbie's dog and Dixie was his mother. And Roscoe was Robbie's brother who died in the AIDS pandemic. And I know that Robbie had a lot of survivor guilt that he survived that pandemic and he's died in this one. So 
<coughs> the poem is called There is Nothing More Holy for Deacon and Robbie. There is nothing more holy than sitting with your love, your friend consumed in a crown of fire, eyes closing to a choking world, lungs hungering for air. There is nothing more holy than to bow to defeat, touch forbidden by order, and all you have is a mantra to quiet, to, all you have is a mantra, your quiet voice warm in a whisper, say, it's okay to let go. Look up, Dixie is waiting in Kentucky. Roscoe readies a different fire. Lois already knows, there she is lying at your feet, her Labrador eyes pool your goodbyes. It's springtime, flowers are in bloom, new light in your garden, enchanted in daffodil, gardenia making its way. Wild pip journeyed to bud, ready to burst from your earthly body, like fruit, when it decays, seed grows anew. This, my darling friend, this is what all our little dying was for to prepare for today. One breath to rebirth. There is nothing more holy than being present. An umbilical cord to nourish your friend. Cocooned as he drifts, sails peristaltic waters. You, a chrysalis, his boat steering. Oceanic waves calling his spirit to a new horizon. Leading him home last breath into the unknown unknown to you too there is nothing more holy than death on the feast of passover thank you all very much thank you thank you sandy thank you elizabeth uh, hello everybody on this side and the other side of the great atlantic pond uh, thanks for the in invitation to be involved and I'd like to thank the organisers and uh, I've enjoyed the readings so far and I look forward to what's to come. Uh, I'm going to read some poems from my book that Dominic mentioned, uh, Fool's Gold, uh, which was published last November by Revival Press and an imprint of the Limerick uh, Writers' Centre. And I'm going to start off by reading a poem called Crows. Swirling in the sky like Luftwaffe and Spitfire, strafing the earth, murdering the silence with their raucous and cacophonous din, swooping like kamikaze in a tailspin, Ace pilots chasing hawks become veterans begging bread. On the ground they may be found like undertakers in their suits of black, striding with their arms behind their backs. Don't feed them, they will pester you, a voice in my head says, but my heart quarrels with that. Thus I am drawn into their squabble. An unleashed dog bounds at them, and they rise above, above the threat, cawing. Perched on an overhead cable, they watch and wait, silently. I would trade everything for their wings, to rise above the haunting things that hunt me into a hungry sky, and I would be content as they to take the risk for crumbs tumbled from her lips. Such morsels of words I long to eat, but I am just a beggar at her feet. The next poem I want to read is called Still Life and it's in memory of my late brother, uh, Michael. A half-worked canvas sits on my easel, a bowl of fruit, green grapes, oranges, on the kitchen table's blue and yellow checkered cloth, Brushes standing in a vase, a gang of punks with hair dyed, 
loafing in the evening light. Half-squeezed tubes of acrylics, some still wearing their caps, rainbow of water jars and a psychedelic palette. All are where I left them when I got the call. I wonder if my suit still fits. I search for a black tie and polish my shoes. Sisters sit, brothers stand, eldest first, youngest last. Protocol recited like a prayer. My sister's scarves add blue and red to the monochrome scene. His tie is green. A stream of mourners, still life, jaded memories, brush strokes in faded pastel shades as unfinished as your days. This next poem is for Lydia and it's called A Cedar of Lebanon. In the cemetery she stands, solitary as a cedar in the sand, proud of the soil that bears her roots, limbs uplifted to the azure sky, asking Allah why, swaying to the haunting hymn of Adhan, a lilting mu'zain from a distant mosque, her lament as ancient as the harp and lyre, hewn from the sweet-scented boughs and played by humble minstrels for kings. I thought I heard the cedar sing, a Sirocco song in the humid night, strummed by wind and hummed by sultans, a harmony that made the willow weep. And from the celestial sphere there came in heavy drops the perfumed tears of angels sent to harvest such a crop. Towering like a minaret, the breeze blows and the cedar bows, and I heard the shanos of your fad salata on the fragrant air calling me to a different prayer, to bury your heart beneath the Beirut stars where you can take your baby to your breast and weep with joy and rest among the rows of earth and scars, there to sleep and be forever blessed. This next poem is called The Raven. Sadness has perched upon my heart, its talons tighten in a vicious grip. I fear that if it is chased away, it will take my heart and eat it in the woods, for it is such a hungry bird that it has stolen almost every word like bread, and I am left with much unsaid. But in my heart I keep a treasure, a love for her without measure, and I simply dread the hour that such a creature might devour all that is sacred in that store. So leave it where it came to rest, where it has begun to build its nest, and we will learn to live together so I may keep my love forever. And surely it may eat the crumbs I scatter on the ground. They are little sorrows that the sparrows gather round. And uh, this next poem is called The Master Gardener. Within the walled garden on a sunny spring day, I sat beneath a bountiful beech with its vernal canopy and silver-bellied parasol and watched the master gardener splice two sapling cherry trees. He bound the wounded hearts a skion and rootstock with bandage and tight knot, skilful as a surgeon at work. He made a bed for the newlyweds and planted them among the forget-me-not. On his knees, as if in prayer, he pressed them down with tender care, and with two sticks he made a cross and staked them there. With rugged hands he fussed the familiar earth. Then I heard him sing an ancient hymn in dulcet tones as he pushed away some heavy stones. When he stood back and gazed, they seemed to look at him in parched appeal, for first he gave them water before he slaked his thirst. He doffed his hat and wiped his leathered brow. That was forty years ago in May, but I still see my father now. Not in this earthly world, with all its pain and sorrow, nor in some mystic Eden up above, where we might meet tomorrow. No, I will make my heaven here, in the garden where he is near. And this is another poem um, in memory of my father. 
um, called Summer Pals. Swimming in the black-backed, silver-bellied rocky river, laughing with the lapping water, pals plunging like otters in the sky-printed pool. In my soul you linger like a summer evening, my shadow nearly as tall as you, ripened by your radiance, your palm as rough as a dog's paw brushed my cheek, you smiled when I winced. I still hear you singing Shenandoah in the smoky port porter air, home on the bar of your bike, that big heart beating near my ear. Strange to be lying stretched on your empty bed when word came knocking to my sleepless head. My brother brought the news he's gone, he said. I held you shoulder high, shuffling in the solemn day, a pallbearer of the past, carrying memories to the grave. On your shoulders I once sat, celebrating victory at a match. Oh, what a joyous day was that. I was light, but you were heavy. I laid my burden down, not ready. And uh, now, um, in the time remaining, I want to read some poems. Uh, yes, that's it. Um, some more recent poems. And uh, this first one is called Belonging. When the verdant victory is declared in birdsong, will you be there in the sacred moment to embrace another spring with all the promise that it brings? When the sun-baked sand scorches my feet and frothy waves cue the chorus like a metronome, will our fingers entwine as we print the wet sand in slow talk filled with hope? When leaves are yellow and ivy arrayed in russet robes, will you gather kindling with me to set our hearts aglow and laugh at the fist of clouds that threaten our cosy love? Will you beckon or banish the tender eyes that look to you beneath the darkening sky? When all is white beneath the silent moon, with gloved fingers will you wave goodbye? Or draw near to warm my heart and kiss my broken mouth and thaw my frozen tongue to sing its winter song? You are my soul, my melody, my dance. And the only place where I belong is in your heart, in sweet romance. This next poem is called The Weary Way. Beneath the lazy lapis lazuli dome, the gorse quilted heather hills seemed soft, a patchwork stitched by a hidden hand. As I walked the rock washed path to where we used to sit, there I rested and I sighed, imprisoned in your lie. A fly in amber forever in a crystallised cocoon, your semi-truth in precious stone. The aromatic resin of your words drew me in like melting butterscotch upon your tongue, to be fossilised forever. Then a host of small clouds gathered like an army on the distant hills, and the cobalt canvas darkened to an ink-blue sky. I gathered up my thoughts and things and trudged the weary way of goodbye. This poem is called Digging. Digging in the sacred site, unearthing history in a forensic archaeology of the heart. My uh, broken pieces assembled, artefacts of the past, to be arrayed in a museum of memories preserved for posterity my words are rusted coins of no intrinsic worth a currency of another time painstakingly excavated from the strata of years soft brushing exposes the hidden hurts what was concealed in the clay of the human soul is revealed in light working the fragments of my thoughts in the golden joinery of verse an apprentice of Kintsugi, aspiring to learn from that potter who repairs crushed and broken hearts. Uh, one, I've been 29 days in solitary confinement and lockdown. Uh, and uh, at the very start of this, on the 16th of March, I wrote this uh, poem called Angel of Death, COVID-19. A messenger of death is walking through the streets, 
striding purposefully he reaps a harvest of fragile souls. Come now, he beckons to the weak, and they fall at his compelling word. You have lived enough, let this planet be the habitation of the young, for you have often said you do not want to stay too long. Can you pass me by, for I have debts of love to pay, they implore upon their knees. Your time has come, the angel whispers in the breeze. But not today, they plead, I do not want to die alone. The angel smiles and says, I am bringing many home. Let me say goodbye, they ask, or let me prove I'm sorry. The time is now, the angel says, to leave this place of folly. And as they weep not for themselves, but for the ones they love, the angel's eyes are turned above. What shall I reply in answer to their tears? Tell them they see the underside of warp and woof, the tangled knots of tapestry, but from above they shall dwell in love and see the beauty and the majesty. And this last poem then that I want to read, um, I wrote this morning as I walked by the river. We're allowed to walk uh, on our own, um, uh, maintaining a safe um, social distance space uh, within two kilometers of our home. And as I walked by the river, I wrote this poem called The First Swallows. Walking by the misty morning river, river, I saw a heron rise on its expansive wings into the pink blush of an oriental canvas. And as I scanned the sky, there were two swallows, white breasts, black wings, flaunting their flying skills. Returning from Angiers, Algiers, I wondered, barnstormers, Heralds of summer, harbingers of hope, dispelling sorrows. And it made me ponder, although this is a time of tears, there will be bright tomorrows. Thank you very much. Hi everybody. This is Francis from Greystones in County Wicklow, Garden of Ireland, as you can see on my doorstep. But today I'm going to be reading from South New York, where I spent 20 years, and it's very close to my heart and thoughts at the moment. I want to dedicate this to the people, my friends on the front line over there, Noel Mullen, a nurse in Bellevue Hospital, Manhattan, Aoife Ford in Stony Brook Hospital, Long Island, my cousin Anne Murray Robinson in Bristol, Connecticut, uh, Jerry Ford, who is an EMT in Montauk, and Bonnie Brady, who's doing Trojan work on the ground up there in Montauk. And my first poem is going to be Manhattan. I climbed up from the subway, arched my back to see the sky. Tall buildings seemed to sway, stone trees in a concrete pile. Arched my back to see the sky as a stream of traffic rippled by. Stone trees in a concrete pile, soaring towards the sun's fire. As a stream of traffic rippled by, tall buildings seemed to say, soaring towards the sun's fire. I climbed up from the subway. The next one is Little Women. You saw the gift under the tree, four girls in Victorian dress on the front. Old fashioned, maroon hardcover, yellow grain paper, no pictures. Happy Christmas from Mammy inside. Years later, you came upon a copy in a school in the South Bronx where your students had never heard of it. You tried to open their minds like pages to the possibilities the world had to offer. You taught them that bold was not bad but brave and rebellious, being willing to stand out. That stories don't all have fairy tale endings and words, as well as sticks and stones, could break their bones. You learnt that Joe 
Beth, Amy and Meg were mere white girls to these girls. That privilege was a book closed in their underclass faces. An American classic had made more sense to a nine-year-old Irish girl after all. Uh, so I lived out in Montauk for nine years, had various jobs, pink tuna taxi driver, naturally good health food store assistant, and waitress for the longest time. So this is one of my waitress poems, and it's called Muscles. Muscles, marinara, or aglio e olio, at the roadside dancing crab, North Shore, Long Island. Chunks of crusty Tuscan bread for dipping, oil dripping, sauce sipping, iced Long Island tea, under a pink flamingo sky. The bartender tanned, ripped, devoured steamers by the pot, slid flesh on tongue, swallowed, sucked insides out, hollowed. He named weekly specials for whoever took his fancy. After me, Muscles Rachel warmed the cockles of his heart. Our ghosts roam deserted tables, bearing platters to serve the gods. Oysters Diane, cherry stone clams, trays of tinkling ink blue pods. And I finally left Montauk in 1999. A few months ago, I found a notebook where I'd obviously written down little notes about leaving. So I wrote this prose poem, So Long Montauk, 1999. I live in a cottage beside Fort Pond, where white-tailed deer roam the yard. At dawn, my bed bathes in an orange sun, or have I left the lights on? From my perch on the kitchen stool at the word processor, I can see crazy golf. Memory Motel, the Owl Shabeen, Harvest Restaurant. Waves ripple at five o'clock of an evening on the last day of September. Every morning in Pink Tuna Taxi, my first stop is the bake shop, best coffee in town. Cold clings or heat pads press my shoulders. I sit on a bench in front of the chamber between calls, read my mail, Chash George, Jerry, Aoife too. Share a cigarette with Sid the Squid. Wait for Jeff to swing out of his truck and open the bookshop. I arrived on the Jitney one June afternoon, sat in the gazebo waiting for my sister Anne. We walked home along the beach to Ditch Plains. What thoughts consumed me then? Not staying, that's for sure. Not living here through the 1990s. There were 60 of us that first summer. The Leps, the locals called us, for leprechauns. By September, we were 10. I cycled all over town today to find somewhere to dump my garbage. There are no bin lorries here, no postmen either. Girls gather on the bench at White's liquor store. Fishing rods tilt from a Jeep Chevrolet. Quaint little drinking village with fishing thrown in, the stickers say. I used to drink here too. The sun, the sun burns my face, branding me to this place. In a gazebo at the end of the island, hearts open. How am I going to leave the crickets chirping, the breeze upon the pond? How will I pack my books and pottery, curtains, cushions, bought with hope. How will I leave the grubby green couch where Maria and Desi smoked, the brown beauty board, this room a safe haven in winter. Patio doors open onto the deck, purple hydrangea, trees bristle, a smooth green lawn leads down to the lake. Waters silver grey, reeds sway, ducks and swans glide by. I told Willie, the landlord I was leaving, looked at the lake, avoided his eyes. At the end of the season, doors are closing, 
like my heart. So uh, eventually I came home in 2006 and I've been back many times and I wrote this after one such visit in December 2017. Okay now, yeah? Yep. And it's called New York, New York. I fastened my seatbelt on flight 1762, Dublin to Stewart International, flicked through the end for Norwegian flight magazine. And in an article on Startup Mystery Tours, I read, you will go wherever you're meant to. Beacon, Cold Spring, Fishkill, Ossining, Scarborough, Tarrytown, Irvington, Dobbs Ferry, Glenwood, Yonkers, Riverdale, Metro North rattles through the stations. I used to live here, live here. I used to live right here. Snow feathers fall on Van Cortland, weaving cobwebs of lace in the trees. Doggy paws print the white velvet park. Broadway is slushed and silent. I used to walk here, walk here. I used to walk right here. Saturday night in McKeown's and McLean, Anya orders crispy baked potato. Liam looks for crispy fries. I'm content with crispy noodles, chicken salad and Mike Fitz still sitting at the bar. I used to celebrate, celebrate here, every Christmas after booking my flight home. He calls the next night to take me to Bread and Brine in Hastings on the Hudson, where we sip mojitos and robust red wine, where our server wears a warm woolen cap. Wouldn't have happened in our bad hair day, not in our bad hair day, not in our day. I buy two dollar gloves on the sidewalk, hear my name called from a passing car. Brenda, my ex next door neighbour, inviting me to Christmas party in Phoenix on the 14th. I used to shop, shop downtown, dance in midtown Manhattan bars. In the Bronx, giant blow ups illuminate the snowy subway. Frosty, Santa, Homer Simpson, Rudolph riding a whale. The Irish boys drink beer inside the tortoise and hare. Andy beckons to me from his bar stool. I used to sit here, sit here, night after night, sit here, when it was called the wild geese. You're not going downtown with all the shit that's going on. What shit, I ask. A bomb has exploded in Fourth Authority. Oh shit, I say. I used to teach in the city, used to teach, used to teach there. Took the number one train all the way to Washington Square. I sat here on 9-11, watched commuters stumble past the windows, covered in a different white dust. This country's fucked, someone said. On Kingsbridge in one yoga for all, I lie flat on the floor for Sharvasana. Inhale to lift, exhale to fall, and find that sweet space. And I know that if New York recovered from 9-11, it will recover from this too. Uh, okay, so this is another uh, one from the time I was on my visit to. Um, Pilgrim's Progress. Kevin Higgins had given us, uh, we were to take a negative emotion that could be written about in a positive way. Stress is necessary, said my cousin Carly on our way to Deptford Mall, Black Friday. As I navigated four lane highways, left hand drive, automatic instead of stick. As I pursued a parking space outside Macy's, a place in line jostling through wide glass yawning doors. Stress got me half price Ugg boots, a marked down jacket, tote bags two for one gel sneakers on sale and another 20% off at the till. Stress found me in a rented Ford Focus, advancing along the I-95, tailgating up the turnpike, inching over George Washington's bridge, snailing into New York State, dwarfed by gigantic, bull-roaring juggernauts. Stress I am grateful for should have been my pilgrim prayer, 
after turkey dinner on Thanksgiving Thursday. And this is the last one I wrote last year for the poetry jukebox. And they didn't pick it, but I still like the poem. <laughs> and it's called Hungry for Love. In Manhattan, I longed for Ma's brown bread, creamery butter, potato crisps, salt and vinegar, bisto gravy, black pudding, digestive biscuits for dunking. In Manhattan, I hungered for home. Back in Dublin, I dreamt of pizza slices, bagels and cream cheese, Reese's peanut butter cups, Hershey's kisses, 60 cent coffee from a Wall Street vendor who knew I liked it dark, sweet, regular. At home, I hungered for love. In the Bronx, construction workers stood in line outside the Irish butcher, dying for bacon and cabbage, fish and chips, shepherd's pie and spotted dick, washed down with pints of porter and Rory Dolans, hunger satisfied, still home sick. Dubliners now dine on takeout mango tree, jasmine house curry, chop suey chow mein, sip prosecco instead of Barry's tea, Merlot, Sauvignon and Champagne. Others in direct provision shelters are out on the streets to roam, hunger for a house to call home. So I, oh, I think I'm just in time. In case you didn't hear at the beginning, that was for Noel, Mullen, Aoife, Ford, Jerry Ford, Bonnie Brady and Anne Murray Robinson. Thank you all. Thank you for listening. Hello, um, my name is Ron Carey. I live in Dublin. Um, I'm sorry about uh, coming a bit late to the party. Um, I just couldn't work the technology. I saw, you're very, all very welcome to my home here in Dublin. I live here with my wife, Kathy, and uh, we have four children and, and we have nine grandchildren. I go, don't get to see them very much now because um, we're in lockdown. We are cocooning. Cocooning, I think it comes from a word meaning resisting the temptation to throw each other out the window. Um, I want to congratulate Sandy and Elizabeth Ann on this wonderful event and all the terrific poets and the terrific poetry we're hearing. I begin by reading some poems from my first collection, which was called Distance. Moving. Joe Busoli sat on the cart beside my four year old self while my mother and father walked to the measured clip of his clopped horse. It must have been an easy pull. A few sticks of furniture, some bric-a-brac and Aunt Babby's china with its caravan of animals. As we crossed Thoman Bridge, the city turned away from us and slipped into her evening dress. Single cars droned by, bumblebees in September, then, coming to a hill, we saw the thousand boxes of the new estate and the house that was to be ours, its emptiness concrete. As we came down the unworn road, its black tar barely solid under the wheels, Joe put the reins into my electrified hands. In her eagerness, my mother ran ahead, keys flashing and a hundred watt solace in her fist. The black eyes of the front room suddenly blaze. From its open window, a young girl called to us, our names ringing new in the darkness. So um, the next poem I'm going to read you is called The Letter. At one time, emigration was the only choice for our young people. And with so few houses having phones, the only real way to communicate was by letter. And these were few and far between. So when one came, it was treated with reverence.
the letter. Like a blind dentist, my mother searches in the red mouth of her purse while our irregular postman waits at the door. That's not necessary, Mrs. Carey, he says stoically, but he doesn't move. His hands are blue, but not from the cold. In the sleety rain, the Christmas post is weeping ink. He places the letter from Hounslow precisely at the centre of their transaction, the loose head of the English Queen held only by a single artery of gum. My mother ignores the generous wad of the envelope until she's pinched together the correct pennies of gratitude. She is finding it hard to concentrate, worrying that the expensive and delicate warmth of the house will escape and roll around outside. She keeps the door pulled against her back with the hook of her foot, still sorting half pennies from thruppenny bits. For the season that's in it, she hands the postman a shilling, so that no doubt of her generosity remains in either mind. She presses the coin in his palm, fixing it home like a tack. She doesn't open the letter, but brings it straight away to the dining room and places it at the head of the table where my father will see it as soon as he comes home. Now, the next uh, poem I want to read to you is called The Islands. When John Billington Singh, the writer of the Playboy of the Western World, visited the Aran Islands, he had no other intention but to observe their way of life. But as soon as we touch the lives of others, come close or interact in any way, we change things forever. The Islands. Imagine yourself, John Millington Singh, come to this place with private watch and ticking clock, where they barely can tell one day from another, where every sunrise the women appear, walking through nettles and maidenhair to the sea, lifting their madder stained petticoats red with secrets, where the currucks spin and dance in the wind, and the men often give themselves away to death. Imagine watching their slow fall from the roof of the sea down to the gardens of the deep, never learning to swim against fate. Imagine leaping sharp Tyrassic fossils until your shoes, handmade in Dublin, are in tiny shreds, so that they cut you a pair of pamputis that need seeping overnight to regain their soft and clawing primeval agility. Imagine yourself on the beach, the stars two feet above your head banging together, the dark jumping towards you as if it had waited all day for you to come. Imagine yourself gone, far from here, yet each night they wind up in your old room, watching the clock you left behind, slicing down the seconds one by one. And now I'd like to read you some uh, from my latest collection. It's called Racing Down the Sun, again by Revival Press. Uh, two years ago, we went to on holidays to Mayo. It's on the west coast of Ireland. It's a beautiful county. But we went too late and we got we we missed the worst. We missed the best of the weather and got the worst of the weather there. One day, Catty wanted to see Belle Mullet, where she had spent some of her childhood holidays. So we drove there. It's about 50 kilometers from where we were staying, but it felt like 200 in the rain. In spite of the poem's title, I want to reassure you that I love Mayo. It is a stunningly beautiful county. Driving rain through Mayo. It was one of those days when God forgot he had created light. We followed the graphite road, penciling its determined way across Mayo. The mist rolled back in its faintness and the car shot through, 
as if we knew exactly where we were going and we might be able to return. Townlands and parishes changed their names as we drove, defying childhood Irish. In thorns, bush and firs, birds cowled under unmanageable tonnage. Feathered in a sheen of permanent rain, tongueless crows watched us, eyes diamante. Big boiled sheep, waterlogged in shagged wool, appeared and disappeared under the pulsing clouds as we drove on beyond the innocence of living. And then, from outer space, the sun sent its beams, searching the byways and the hedgerows for wonder, and found it in us. In the simple brilliance of realization, our souls uncoupled their safety belts and floated free. Like any son, I wanted my father to be proud of me, but I wasn't very good at the things he was good at, um, fixing things and making things by hand. But I wanted to prove to him that I was well down that road, that scary road to manhood. So one summer I asked him if I could lay, uh, help him lay a footpath for one of the well-to-do families in the Limerick area. I was about 14 or 15 at the time. The long path. Once in summer, when my father was a bear and I was a Russian poem to imperfect youth, the sun came close to the earth and we stripped down to trousers and Wellington boots to lay a footpath in the tight garden of the strand. My father was young then, full in the wonder of manhood, muscle, and the loneliness of men. Unified by the sweat of work, we lightly touched some kind of understanding, no more or less. At midday, Mrs. Burke brought a jug of lemonade, profoundly cold, with deep green islands of lime, thick and loose in the slob of melting icebergs. At the hose, we watched the way the abrasive dust, both our heads prematurely twinned in grey. You're burned to a crisp, my father said, pointing to my back. Turning the crucified skin between my shoulders, I cried out. All that afternoon, in the chill of Burke's kitchen, overpowered by chamomile, I listened to the higher mixer beat sand and cement to concrete in its iron heart. And this last poem is called Houston Station. Um, Kathy and I were, Houston Station by the way, is uh, one of the main stations in Dublin, railway stations in Dublin. Kathy and I were just getting to know each other when the events of this poem took place. I was just finding out what a prize I had. She was constantly surprising me with her humanity and gentleness. And after 48 years of marriage, she still does. Houston Station. The train was deciding if it would ever move. In the seat across, a young man, even younger than us, was shedding the last of his humanity. You still smoked then and reached across the table to offer a cigarette. In the kindness of that moment, both he and I understood how a person can wear goodness like skin. The cigarette trembled in his hand, a visible sign of the earthquake and fissures within. You took it back and lit it and placed it between his lips, and as you did, he reached and held your hand like a lover or a father or a child would hold on to his mother. And all of this without one word spoken, one winter's morning at Houston Station, while the train was deciding if it would ever move. 
Uh, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the poems. You can order Distance and Racing Down the Sun from Revival Press at the Limerick Writer Centre website. And you can connect to me on Facebook and Twitter. And in these dark times, I'd like to remember what Seamus Heaney said. If we winter this one out, we can summer anywhere. Stay safe. Good night. Hello everyone. I presume I'm live. I hope I'm live. And so I just want to say first of all, thanks very much to Sandy and to Elizabeth Ann and to Dominic for facilitating this fantastic platform for all of us to share our work. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems for you. Uh, I'm going to do mostly newer poems, newer poems that are going to go into my, my third collection of poems. So I'm going to do a few older ones as well. Uh, congratulations as well to all the poets who read before me. Um, absolutely fabulous poetry. The uh, poem I'll start with is um, it's a poem about, and I suppose in the current climate, it's a poem that's about enjoying place because we're all having our freedoms kind of limited at the moment for the greater good. Um, but it would really put you in mind of enjoying place and enjoying that place that is mostly yours, your home city or your hometown. And uh, the name of this poem, and it's about the river that uh, Kieran was speaking about earlier in his last poem. Uh, the name of the poem is Just By Chance. And it comes from uh, my first collection, The Rain on Cruises Street, uh, this one here. This is the place we have been coming to sense. This is the hour, and yet just by chance, that the stars were out that first night, and their light just by chance glittering on the Shannon's lurching surface. A near full moon suspended over the centre of Thoman Bridge, just by chance of where we were stood on the quay. And just by chance it was the most brittle silence with which we had no words to shatter. Did I think to remove my coat and place it over your shoulders, brushed your neck with my fingers, just by chance of how they shook? Then, surely, it was just by chance of the way of the tide that a pair of swans came floating out from the bridge's far side towards us. And so I learned that swans mate for life, just by chance you'd read it somewhere once, but couldn't remember where. As though just by chance you said that, did it occur to me then I may never have a better opportunity to kiss you than there and then. That average Wednesday, Limerick was the most romantic place ever and just by chance. And so gently turning you around to face me, just by chance of the arbitrary direction of a convenient wind, your russet hair all blown back. And so just by chance, the whole of your beautiful face staring back at me. We kissed our first kiss in that unlikeliest of ways. Sometimes things happen so perfectly and yet just by chance. I'm going to move now to uh, this uh, second collection. Um, it's called uh, Bad. What is it called? Bad news, good news, bad news. Everybody gets that title wrong, including me, especially me. Uh, we've hopefully got um, a few people listening from America, and I suppose um, I want to read this poem uh, for them. It's maybe taking advantage of something um, that a lot of people around the world believe about Irish people. But this is one of the things that they believe and is actually completely true. This poem is called Grand. I hope I'll never have to suffer the pain of being grand. I mean of being really grand. Not the grand we say we are when we mean we're really not. And then others agree they too are grand when they are so far from it. 
I imagine famished bodies in the wasteland bogs of Ireland back in 1845 telling one another how grand they are, one upping each other any way they can and on that then and still not yet calibrated scale of grandness Irish people seem to feel innately in their blood and bones. And if you were even to ask Irish history how it is, matter-of-factly as could be, you'd be told, grand. And you should know that the same history's grandness gave you the grandness you express today and every day, your precious birthright. Yet there is that understanding between you that grand doesn't really exist and never will in an Irish future. And in a way, that's, as you say, grand because you'd never wanted to. The idea is so frightening and so ghostly. And were we ever grand? And again, of course, I mean really grand. We'd probably never get over it, telling each other we're grand and meaning exactly that. So I'm going to go to some Newer work, uh, I'm going to do a few poems from my forthcoming third collection. Um, all my poem, poetry books are uh, from Salmon Poetry. Um, thank you very much, Jesse, for having me. Um, I'd be lost without you. And yeah, so <laughs> during this whole time, this whole bizarre time, the thing I miss most is going to cafes, simple little things like that. but. You know, I realize it's the simple things that, that mean the most to you in your day to day. So I want to, I want to read a poem about the um, thing that I miss most, which is going to the cafes. This poem is called Crumbling. Find a cafe where the proprietor is rude and sighs when you politely ask her for coffee, where you can expect to never receive a smile and to always be given a rotten turpentine brew. Make it your regular place. If she brings you the best coffee you've ever tasted and greets you in syllables that are music and smiles a smile that's warmer than that coffee, this is not the place for you. Drink fast, get out of there, never return. If you do, make no mistake, she will break your heart. She will come to the table at every opportunity and she will speak her extraordinary music and she will smile the kind of smiles that make a reasonable man such as you ache to get down on one knee right there where moments ago she'll have swept up some crumbs and been tantalizingly close. The rude proprieties won't ever bring you a cookie. <laughs> because, quite simply, she despises you. She will charge you and then hope you choke on it. And you might do, because it will be a vile cookie. But it won't be such a bad way to go, choking on her shit cookie in her dreary cafe, sliding from your chair onto its shiny, its grimy linoleum floor. It could be so much worse, after all. You could have been in the other cafe, where you can be sure the cookie you haven't ordered that she gives gratis will be sumptuous, without doubt the best you'll ever have tasted, so impossibly delectable that as you gorge on it, you will not even notice your heart is breaking, crumbling to pieces inside her hands. So I'm going to move to uh, a poem called The Ghosts Next Door. I'm going to read this poem uh, for my friend Tanya Farley. They are at it again, the ghosts next door. They are having loud, devil-may-care sex. There is nobody living in the house next door. An estate agent comes by from time to time, some upkeep, straightening the sign out front. The lights are always switched off in there. We've tried banging on the walls, shouting out for some quiet, but the ghosts ignore us. 
We are talking about bills that need paying and how the kids aren't doing so well at school and how the dog's infection has come back and they are making love, all their moans high and haunting. She died first, he followed three months later. Those were three months of silence, as though he was just waiting, as though he was just sitting and waiting. Immediately after, it began the sex. Every night we hear them at it, insatiable. We don't have sex anymore, with neither the time nor the energy. We are too worried, frustrated, anxious, regretful. We are insecure. Instead, we try to get some sleep before work. We lay in our bed, our bodies separated, and we listen to the ghosts next door, and we wonder how little has come to this. So, I am... I'm going to go to the house on the other side now and read one about them because it wouldn't be fair to just read about the neighbours on one side. We've got to even it out. Uh, this is more about their dog uh, on the other side. It's called The Dog Living Next Door. It's a, it's a villanelle and it's dedicated to an amazing Irish poet called John W. Sexton. If you don't know him, you should change that immediately. The dog living next door is busy howling at the night. He is singing a series of villanelles to the full moon. My wife says she will shoot the fucker, and she might. She needs sleep now, not poetry. She turns on the light, throws the clock by the bed at the wall across the room, but the dog next door carries on howling at the night. Probably because he's unemployed, couldn't give a shite that it's after 2 a.m. He's just feeling inspired, I assume. My wife says she will shoot him, and she really might. She has work soon. She has to be up before it's bright. I couldn't really be sure this is a villanelle. This tune, the dog next door, is this moment howling at the night. But sense a sureness of form, repeating lines set right. Please, will you just shut up? I have to be at work soon. I'm going to shoot that fucker, she says. She might. I don't mention enjoying his poems. There'd be a fight. But it's so long since I heard poetry sung to the moon. The dog living next door is busy howling at the night. My wife says she will shoot the fucker. And she might. So I have a poem that I want to read for Elizabeth Ann because she so patiently uh, got us all set up um, and running over the last several days and she likes Leonard Cohen and I just happen to have this Leonard Cohen poem. Leonard Cohen is dead. Leonard Cohen is dead and I have to live I have to learn to live in a world he's no longer in. To make matters worse, she won't return my calls. It isn't the first time she hasn't returned my calls, but the last time she didn't, I just put on some Leonard Cohen and the hours went by and then eventually she did. Of course, that time was very different now because he wasn't dead and I wasn't adjusting to living in a world he had left. I could send her a text message and in it, let her know that Leonard Cohen is dead. Maybe she hasn't heard yet. She would surely call then, but maybe she wouldn't call. And then Leonard Cohen would be dead and she wouldn't be returning my calls or my text, and it couldn't be because she hasn't yet heard the news of his death. The battery in her phone isn't dead, because the battery in her phone is immortal. The battery in my phone sometimes dies, just like Leonard Cohen has done, but the battery in her phone never does. 
I know that while she is not returning my calls, and while Leonard Cohen is dead and unable to console me the way he did last time, the battery in her phone lives. In the end, I decide to call her once more. Again, she doesn't pick up. Leonard Cohen is still dead. So I'm just looking at the time and I probably have a minute to do one more quick one. Um, so I will do the poem about what Irish people are probably missing the most, which is the pub, if we're being honest. Um, but fair play to the country, they're handling it. Um, so this poem is called, it's from the Rain on Cruces Street and it's called Pints with God. And hopefully we'll be able to enjoy one or two soon. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Pints with God. Meeting God, meeting with God for a pint. He should have been here 20 minutes ago, fashionably late as always. Over the years I've come to know God can be a little vain some ways, arrogant even, a bit the worship me and no other type. He's cancelled on me the last two times we made plans. Always the same excuse. Things are hectic lately at the office. When he gets here, I'll be aloof with him. But then God always knows just what to say. Will beg, forgive me as I would forgive you. And with a grin, propose a toast to forgiveness. About to perform his favourite miracle. Turning two pints into many. Thank you and good night. Hello Sandy, Dominique, Elizabeth Ann. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful Titanic event. And I'm so privileged to be in the company of such wonderful poets. And I'm here in the Shannon side village of Castle Connell with my husband Mark. And I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can somebody send me a sign okay now I see um, I'm in the Shannon side village of Castle Connell with my husband Mark and I would like to dedicate the reading tonight to Mark and also to my son David and his partner Kleena and new baby Reuben in Ennis and especially to my daughter Anne-Marie her husband Eric Daniel Killian and Nora in Grand Forks North Dakota So my first poem is called Up the Field and it's where my journey into poetry began. And in recent years I've come back to poetry as Dominic said in the introduction. Um, so here's where it all started. Up the Field Up the headland of meadow field into cups of hazelnut and silver birch Cracked kippens underfoot. Small birds startled and winged and winged shrill notes to spirits high on swaying trees. Step after step, I left shade of boughs behind. Twill twirled under a wide open sky and ran up my hill of dreams to slide down the shimmering path of once gravel stones. Landed in a carved hollow and arrived where the cat had not got my tongue. You listened to my ramblings and some even had lines of rhyming words. And some words we agreed only we would know. And when asked, what did you get up to? Just up the field was my reply. Mam sent her eyes to heaven, back down again, and smiled at me. Clouds and constellations contained for the next telling, with you, my make-believe friend. My next poem is called Tart. Um, and I suppose it's the mother and daughter relationship. It's about advice and memory. And I suppose with advice, it's advice that was willingly given. 
but are not always received or taken on board. Tart. I tie her red flowery apron round my waist, dither whether to weigh. Instinct will serve you well, she used to say. Handfuls of flour sieved into her ceramic crack bowl. Some sugar, a chunk of butter. I coax the mix to a pliant ball. See hands of raised veins that are hers. Always make two or more. When they smell it, they'll want it straight away. But it's better on the second day, she used to say. I knead on the lightly dusted board and cut the lump into four. Over and back with the rolling pin, the sheet stretches out and when I turn my back, it shrinks against my will. I peel bramleys stained with summer blush and sprinkle tangy slivers with sugar and spice before I trim and seal the case. I wonder, and yes, there are enough shavings to finish with her crown, the insignia leaves on top. I recall using my new digital scales. I met her a frangipan tart. That's tasty, but I'll stick with what I know, she said. And staying with the apples, my next poem is called Orchard Wound. And I suppose most of us would have skimmed apples on the way home from school. And that's how this poem started out. And it ends up a tender moment. Orchard Wound. I came in from school and looked round the yard to get in without her seeing, but she was there, taking in the state of me, as streaks of blood stained my ribbed white socks. Did it come in school? she asked. She lost me. I had to admit, I pierced my thigh on the thorny wire of Palmaher's orchard gate, as Pa chased and sniffed forbidden fruit. She was silent as she washed and stung my wound with TCP. When I was all cleaned up, she gave me red lemonade and fancy biscuits and tucked a stray wisp behind my ear. And for the next poem, I'm going to the schoolyard when I was about eight or nine. Um, and in this poem, there's an Irish language expression, Lanirig, which means um, go on, go ahead, for the benefit of our US re or listeners, viewers. Chain Tig, 1968. It was a given to play at opposite ends of the schoolyard. The undrawn Maginot line stretched from the twelve-paned middle window to midway between two multi-pillared concrete sheds. Seized by something bubbling up inside, I reached and caught two hands, one from either side, and shouted game, game of chainting. We girls in cardigans knitted by mothers, boys in short pants fastened by braces, grabbed hands, swiveled, screeched and coiled, and together breached the line. The master leaned against the pebble-dashed wall, tamped briar pipe, inhaled and puffed, and surveillance done in a swirl of smoke, he rang the bell. Victorious, we dispersed right and left, formed two opposing lines, and waited for the order. Lanerig. Would it be the stick? 
or perhaps a truce to share one concrete space. And I'm happy to tell you, this isn't in the poem now, but just as an aside, um, that moment did lead to a truce and the sharing of concrete space. Now, for my next poem is called Amelia, your posy book. And this was published in an anthology by Revival Press called Second Sight, uh, Stories and Poems from Limerick Writers' Centre. And it was edited by Ron, Ron Carey, um, whom you heard earlier. And thank you, Ron, for all your hard work. And I suppose on the theme of the Titanic, and I suppose linking in with Attracta, it's about crossing borders. And in this case, this book, um, this poem has crossed borders from Germany to Switzerland to Ireland and now North Dakota. And it's basically about how roots run deep. Um, and it's called Amelia, your posy book. And sorry, just a little word there. In Germany, a posy book consists of verses and rhymes written by friends and family. And it would be similar to what we'd know as an autograph book. Faded wrap hid the weft and warp of embroidered roses. Centurions of the heart on the cover of your posy book. Cursive script promised a future of love and happiness. Sidestepping stained words and suspicions in Winterbach, 1942. Your mother's curlicues laced a page. Her words leave failure in the past and not look behind. Her days waiting for news of her uniform son. Your father's straight hand counseled to live simply for a true and happy life. His nights deciphering crackles of foreign news. Wishes and dreams ferried you o'er borders. Time settled on the pages. And in the margins, you drew black crosses and noted dates in memory of faces and interwoven dreams. On a late winter evening, pine and cinnamon in the air, you nodded to the sepia people spread across the mosaic table and said, If I had only known how leaving turns into longing, the longing that only those who leave know. In the box of personal effects, framed photos, faded trinkets and treasure of treasures, your gift wrapped posy book, its threads still spinning through hearts and borders. And the next poem, I call it my very happy poem, and especially for Reuben's parents. Name. They slip into Sunday, scanning headlines, sipping the last of the coffee, half listening to the hum of the radio. Kathy, D Kathy Davy sings, Reuben, you're bringing sunshine before you. Simultaneous smiles at the breakfast table. On the ochre tiled floor, arms round each other. A heel sticks out through her ripened bridge belly. They lean and sway. Their eyes agree. The name of their longed for little one. I suppose following on from Attractus poetry earlier and I suppose all the people that went from Ireland on the Titanic and on many ships. Uh, my next car poem is called Green Card. And it's about the precious relationship between grandmother and granddaughter. And I dedicate it to Anne-Marie. 
green card granted. You arrived to see her still drawing sweet Afton. Another's hand her smoke holder holding court from borrowed wheelchair surrounded by carers blister packs accoutrements. No photos this time. The moments long held by her, by you, as you both prepared to go. My next poem is called Golden Memory 1989. The new house had a back garden of high grasses, rushes, stacked up bricks, offcuts and all sorts. You found your rhythm swinging borrowed billhook and discovered blisters and muscles. Six-year-old sailed on a reclaimed raft of discovery. Three-year-old dug holes to another hemisphere. A small hand held a bloom under my chin and chimed. It shines, you like butter. Tickled me and stayed for a cuddle. Midas summer in a back garden, kissed by sunshine and oceans and oceans of buttercups. I'm not sure, have I still got time? Okay, one last poem, so. End of year walk, 2019. During days of abeyance, between Christmas and New Year, under a night or down sky, we crunched the path to the partying weir. One side, beige bent sedge and rusted fern, fishermen cast lines across the glassy shannon from, ten from tents of tackle and Christmas leftovers. The other, bare limbs of sycamore and hawthorn, shelter for baby green ferns and yellow gorse blooms, and the coconut scent stays secreted till spring. We smile at passers-by, as together and apart, we ponder memories and proffer hope this end of year. So I think... I'm ending up here, so sending hope to all of you and thanking you for joining with me this evening. Uh, good night to all. Thank you. Good evening uh, or good afternoon. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me out there. My name is Michael Jurak and I am coming to you from County Tipperary, Ireland. Um, it's a great pleasure and uh, privilege to be part of this wonderful celebration of poetry and to join such a talented array of poets. I'm going to be uh, reading poetry and uh, this is what it's going to, the finished product is going to look like. Um, I grew up on a farm in uh, North Tipperary, about 15 miles from Limerick City. And the farm has since been more or less obliterated uh, by the construction of a motorway. And when I am driving past on that motorway, I find myself literally burrowing deep beneath the fields on which I played and worked as a boy and as a young man. And in this first poem, uh, I connect my home place with Lower Manhattan and Ballymun, which is an area of Dublin which was once notable for its high-rise apartment blocks. So the common thread between the three settings is a sense of altered landscapes or skyscapes. And ironically, uh, in referring to um, Lower Manhattan, I don't focus on the 9-11 uh, debacle. Rather, uh, do I draw attention to the young Frenchman, Philippe Petit, 
the wire walker who crossed over between the roofs of the Twin Towers back in 1974. The poem is called Air Walking. To reenact his coup dans le ciel, Petit must scale a latter day Jacob's ladder, plug his walk wire to air terminals, to become again the human blackbird hovering above Battery Park. To plant potatoes in the pond field, I must swim out over the M7 motorway, nudge the tubers into furrows bereft of dung and soil. Those spuds might fill the pot of a housewife high atop Ballymun, her feet no longer touching the ground that's cut from under all of us. Uh, when television came to our rural neck of the woods in 1962 uh, with the advent of the national TV station, uh, not many households uh, possessed uh, a TV set of their own. So for people like me, uh, getting to see uh, TV programmes entailed uh, going out to visit the homes of more affluent neighbours. And that also meant having to confront my childhood fear of darkness. A patch of darkness. Forty paces, give or take, from our front door to Moroni's black and white TV. The first ten bathed in kitchen window light. The final twenty lit by a public lamp above a crossroads public water pump. A patch of utter darkness in between. They say that darkness is mere absence of light, a gravelled path the same morning as night. But tell that to the bandits and assassins, to the sly beasts lurking in the bushes. Tell it to the boy hot-footing heart and mouth to catch the fugitive or arrest and trial. Uh, my local village um, was about two miles north of my home place and uh, it's a, a tiny place. Uh, the Irish language version of the name is Canucon Onainin, the little hill of the white bird. Uh, it's so small that if you blinked you'd uh, pass through it without noticing, but it does have a railway station. and. Uh, I've always been enchanted by the romance of trains and railways and, and rail stations. And for five years, I commuted by rail from that station to secondary school or high school, as you would call it in the States. So this is my homage to my local railway station. And uh, in the poem also, I mention a number of uh, wonderful poems about railways and rail stations uh, written by uh, British and Irish poets like Philip Larkin, John Montague, Danny Absey, Edward Thomas and um, John Betjeman. The poem is called Bird Hill Station. Not Thomas's Adelstrop where no one left and no one came, nor Larkin's Hull the three-quarters empty train, gliding to where sky and Lincolnshire and water meet. Not the windy, weedy platform of Betjeman's Pershore. Nobody about but a conscript saying goodbye to his love. Nor was it Montague's rain-washed Californian station. All legendary obstacles ranged beyond it. Not even Apsay's, not Adelstrop. The wrong train, and a very pretty girl leaning out, refusing his gaze. No, this was Bird Hill, Canuckon on Aineen, the right train. One quarter full, 8.20, no obstacles, wending from Thorn Hill to where Palock and 80 acres meet. And students grim as conscripts, heavy bags and hearts, equations to solve, Words were to learn, downcast eyes deflected from willows, herbs and grass. 
the rocking rhythm muffling all the birds of Latina Bay and cool the Dornery. Um, when I was about 12 or 13, uh, the Cold War was at its most intense and uh, its most menacing. And uh, we in Ireland were four square behind uh, America in that conflict. Um, in fact, during the Kennedy years, you could say that Ireland was virtually a 51st state of the Union. And we were also uh, expected to disapprove of everything that came across or came from behind the Iron Curtain. But in my young mind, I was prepared to make exceptions, especially for Lev Yashin, the Russian football goalkeeper, nicknamed the Black Panther and uh, regarded as the best goalkeeper in the world. Uh, he was awarded the Ballon d'Or, which is the, the award for a European footballer of the year, a rare achievement for a goalkeeper. Leaving aside, for children of the Cold War, the world was black and white, or white and red. We loved America, its White House gleaming, the Kremlin, all grim walls and military hardware, leaving aside those astonishing onion domes. The West was won by cowboys in white hats, leaving aside the many trails of tears. Siberia was gulags and frozen tundra. America stood for peace and democracy, leaving aside Hiroshima, Bay of Pigs. And the new Camelot, leaving aside the infidelities, had an Irish Catholic king and a chic queen. Khrushchev was short and bald and lacking manners. Remember that shoe banging at the UN? And had he been picked off from a grassy knoll in Baku, Onassis would not have courted Nina Kay. We feared Soviet spies, but approved of US surveillance. Gary Powers had such a handsome face. And the U2, leaving aside Bono, The Edge and co, was cool. CIA, soft vowels, good. KGB, bad. Elvis and Nashville, Connie Francis and Pat Boone, Hollywood, Marlon Brando, Norma Jean. What could the USSR offer us, leaving aside Stravinsky, Shostakovich, the Bolshoi? Yes, Sputnik rocked, Laika was a pretty dog, and Gagarin had charisma. But when push came to shove, won the moon race, pulling up. At the Olympic Games, the USA kicked Russian ass. If you leave aside the wrestling, lifting and gymnastics. Where was the red Arnold Palmer, Cassius Clay, leaving aside Brummel and Yashin? Yashin. Even in the black and white, or white and red, Cold War days, we envy them their black spider, the goalkeeper who in Yevtushenko's poem comes rushing off his line, his ballon d'or. Um, one American institution I have always remained very attached to is the classic movie Western. Um, I love the, the old um, conventions of that genre. You might call them cliches, but uh, one man's cliche is another man's convention. And I love the old saloon doors and the shootouts and the tumbleweed and so on. And uh, sometimes on Friday nights, I scroll through the TV channels looking for a sepia-tented, uh, half-forgotten old Western to take my mind off more um, serious matters. Friday Night Western Friday night, the remote scrolling to wailing harmonica and stuttering banjo. So I must enter a semi-sepia world the buttes and mesas of Monument Valley, 
campfire and starlight, run the gauntlet of engines, desperados, rustler gangs, my only companions, my rifle, pony and me. Maybe a lilting honky-tonk piano will lure me through the batwing doors of a plywood saloon to mingle with the ranch hands and the fur trappers, the poker players and the good-natured whores. Until the ominous strains of the cello signal the showdown that will set apart the righteous heroes and the craven cowards. Step outside. Nothing stirring but dust and the nervous horses at the hitching posts and treacherous bandits, black hats, lurking and prowling. Holsters caressed by itchy fingers, a staccato of gunfire, the obligatory death dive from the roof of the general store, the immoral high ground. And when the smoke disperses and the townsfolk shuffle from shuttered gloom into the light, a doe-eyed Vera Miles or Angie Dickinson will melt into the marshal's sinewy arms. Whippoorwill and chaparral, cactus and tumbleweed, Stetsons, saddles, spurs, cheroots, train whistle and wagon wheels, Rio Bravo, Laramie, Friday night TV, my rifle, my pony, and me. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time now. Um, I think I'll finish with two short ones. Uh, the first is uh, a tiny little uh, love poem. Uh, it's about a place in Dublin which uh, holds uh, happy memories for my wife and me. Uh, memories that date back a long time to the early 1970s. Dufferin Avenue. In Avenue and in love. No fireworks show above us two. No push and shove, no hullabaloo, no holy dove, just me and you, hand in love, in love, in Dufferin Avenue. And um, the final poem is um, not included in my new collection. It's a very recent poem written for the times that are in it. And uh, it ends on an optimistic note. It's called Lucky Stars. The world has closed in upon us. The hills like shops are shuttered up. Our new horizons, walls and privet hedges that gainsay excursion. But there is vibrancy in this garden. The birds of spring are about their business and the stream by the edge of the lawn ripples with sustained applause. Although we crave the warmth of human touch, smiling faces and cheerful voices Greet us from our phones and tablets. We are at war, our leaders say, with an invisible enemy. A phony war liable to turn real at any moment. But we are digging in. We pull together, adapt to wartime rations, not asking for so much. Like the horizon, our egos must condense. And yet, the sky at night fills up with stars. Let's call them lucky. Shower them with thanks. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing the remainder of the readings. Uh, thanks again. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think I have this working properly. Uh, just wanted to thank uh, Sandy and Elizabeth Ann first for organising this tonight and Dominic especially for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, it's been great listening to all of the familiar voices from uh, the poetry scene around Limerick. We've been missing that a lot over the last few weeks. Uh, I'm going to start with two new poems and um, then I'll go back through some older ones that will hopefully be in my first book when that comes out. Uh, just inspired I suppose by the theme of remembering the Titanic I wanted to remember uh, both sides of my family uh, to start with. Uh, this first poem is called The House of Ticking Clocks. 
It was the house of ticking clocks, so preoccupied with time and its perpetual passing, incessant, no room or moment, free from sixty beats per minute, metronomic ticks and tocks echoing off cold bathroom tiles, pendulum beats on bare bedroom walls, marking every second that they are not here, queen and king gone, never to return, their castle still preserved somewhere between museum and mausoleum, every shelf and cabinet still displaying treasured artefacts, smiling faces framed and gazing down, up, out, guardian angels looking out for the living, each had waved goodbye from the front door for the last time, had gone to rest side by side, and so the house of ticking clocks chimed to mark each hour since they died. Uh, this next poem was inspired by an old photograph that was shared on Facebook last year, and it's called Like and Share. What's special in an old family portrait? Is it the sunny day and rolled up sleeves, the hairstyles and fashions of the era, the bold colours of a film from a dark room in an age before high definition or digital filters? or memories shared by algorithm rather than sentiment, by targeted advertising, then quickly forgotten or lost in a flood of vacuous distractions, all sound and fury signifying nothing. Perhaps. Maybe it's the imperfection, the innocence, forgetting while caring for the pets to pose, those pure smiles of those no longer with us. Um, the next poem I'm going to read was the first one that I ever got published and then after that the rest of them are all uh, I suppose to remember the friends, uh, the other poets, teammates, the people who I'd love to be spending time with at the moment but uh, hopefully I'll see them all again in the next month or so. This one is called Ripple Shivers. I have seen countless different kinds of whites and multicoloured lights on the murky surface of the Shannon when night has fallen on this city. I have stepped around the broken green and clear glass pieces on the ground, the flattened blue and gold beer cans, the smouldering ends of cigarettes. I have heard the roar of engines pass, the screech of tyres as they break the snares and beats of stereos that blare from cars stopped at red lights. I have smelt the damp from alleyways, hiss, exhaust fumes, scattered chips, half drowned in salt and vinegar. They assault the air on nights like this. I have felt the breeze pass through the streets between the buildings damp and cool with bits of dust and dirt and rain from scaffold cages on new hotels. I have turned my head and walked away, looked down on the river from the strand, seen formal ripple shivers there, and preferred those reflections to reality. Uh, so I wrote that when I was a teenager, but I think most of it still works. Uh, this next one was inspired by the Stanzas Poetry Collective and uh, Every year they used to celebrate their birthday with an event called a weekend of words and this one came from my first experience of that. And it is called a weekend of words. He pauses passing the mirror and peers deep into his own eyes and wonders if he'll ever be the same again or if he's changed inside as if his mind was forever altered by that long weekend the binge, the flood, the bender, four frantic days and nights, reticence and caution abandoned for the chance to embrace new sensations. He opened up, drank everything in, refused nothing, refused to shun strange new companions and all their queer behaviours, promoting new perceptions of wrongs and rights, all their dangerous ideas, an overdose of mental stimulation, Shackles and rainbows, whips and chains, illicit thoughts and improper nouns, swarming, swirling, deconstructing, overexcited, overwhelming, 
consciousness and pupils rapidly expanding in a pinball rage of lights and buzzers, alarming imagery and rhetoric, recklessness and chemistry under control, structures crumbling and a fight to survive, as with each hit of words his mind was blown. Uh, this next one is a little bit newer. I experimented a bit with different styles last year and I managed to get this one into the Stony Thursday book. The uh, Great Limerick Run is a big event in Limerick City and has been getting bigger and bigger over the last few years. Unfortunately, this summer's event has been put back at the very least until October. But uh, most years it happens on Maybank holiday, Limerick. Although some find it mad what we call fun, the lengths to which we'll go to get our thrill, it's great to get out, greet the world and run. True, there are softer threads which could be spun and gentler things to do with time to kill. But it's not madness, no, to call this fun. To persevere under the burning sun, to battle wind and rain, all focus, will, the great passion to face nature and run is strong enough to shirk comforts and shun temptation, gluttony and sloth to fill moments of freedom with this form of fun. With or without the thunderous starting gun, above or staring up at some great hill, we move outside with this passion to run. No matter where we've come from, lost or won, raw from the heat or bitter with the chill, and though some find it mad what we call fun, it's great to get out, face the world and run. And uh, I liked how uh, Michael Jurak included a poem about Lev Yashin, um, because when I'm not running I like to be a goalkeeper myself, and I've written a series of um, seven or eight poems about goalkeeping over the years and this is the goalkeeper part seven i made the mistake of diving one cold january sunday morning on frozen mud in the mouth of the goals to catch a rolling ball too enthusiastic to pay heed to the good advice of my teammates too eager to show off my skill to stop the ball hitting the net Ignoring all the warnings and rejecting all the memories of awkward landings and bruises in matches all the winters previous. Trying to hide my wincing face, too proud to let them know my pain, then stalling on the stairs to grip my swollen knee and hip the following day. Such feelings return in hot July, lessons still not learned from pains gone by. A heat wave hardens goalmouth mud to clay, and we play two cup matches in three days. No time to fear for slightly damaged knees. The second game's a draw, it's penalties. But injured joints don't seem to feel so sore when an opposing striker fails to score. And I think I just have two left. Um, this one's fairly self-explanatory, it was uh, inspired by a house party for New Year's Eve a couple of years ago. I call it Old and New. When we are old and we look back, do you think we'll still recall the time we gathered for that New Year's party? The apartment, seven storeys up, with bird's eye view of the city centre, when the fireworks display was cancelled late before the eve. That weekend, an Atlantic storm threatened from the northwest coast. The council feared the strands would flood, and when the midnight countdown rang out, five, four, three, two, we turned towards the windows, childlike in our great surprise. As Gary Owen, Cahardavon, Castle Troy off in the distance, Thoman Gate, St Mary's Park and the island field burst into life. Lights erupted on the horizon over Thomond Park and King John's Castle, high above churches, John's Cathedral, 
every estate with its own show of defiance, extravagance, celebration, fireworks sparking like a thousand starlings as far as our eyes could see, daring to defy authority, a ring of colour around the city, no gale or downpour to temper the beauty. All the while in the shadows below, a little gang of revellers loitered, a huddled murder of hooded crows on the wrong side of the high locked gate between Riddler's pub and the old Franciscans, young and reckless in plain sight, oblivious to our spectacle, desperate to sneak in for a drink. They boosted the girl up carefully first, then dumped the next lad in arse over tit. The last two took flight up Henry Street, ringing in the new year giddy, squawks and giggles echoing round the otherwise deserted streets. The kind of messing they'll soon forget, just another gathering left behind like rainy school days, classrooms and corridors fading to grey. Uh, just for anyone who's not familiar with Limerick, there was a long list of local place names in that last poem. Uh, all of the different estates spread out around the city centre. Uh, this last poem is called Portraits and thanks again for putting together a great evening and for everyone who is listening to my stuff. It's a strange new experience doing this online. You tease me, seeking words, something special just for you. But when I think of you, it is in pictures, vivid. And I remember moments of music and drama as if we were actors in classic scenes timeless, everything momentous and in glorious technicolour, all passion and danger and childlike excitement, you in iconic black dress and flowing red hair, soft painted lips, sipping red wine or garnished gin, purple polish glittering at your fingertips and suitably, typically elegant in sensuous red lamplight, or pure and bare on crisp hotel sheets, wrapped in clean white towels by a bath of sweet bubblegum pink or perfumed oils and petals, beaming with joy and clasping soft new burgundy leather or swooshing along a city street past a swirl of summer flowers, practically a glow in bright yellow and smiling as if to light up the whole town or even just one corner of a bar or coffee shop. A paradox of style and substance waiting to be immortalised in song or film or script, if only an artist could do you justice. Thank you. Hi, lovely to be here this evening. My name is Eileen Sheehan and I'm coming to you from Killarney uh, in County Kerry in Ireland. Thanks a million to Sandy Anon to Elizabeth Ann and especially as well to Dominic Taylor at the Limerick Writers' Centre for organising this feast of poetry this evening. Uh, so lovely to be here uh, and crossing the fingers that all the technology goes well. Um, the first poem I'll read is um, one when I was in a, a previous type of lockdown. I wrote it a few years ago when I was actually confined to the house uh, due to an injury, not not due to the dreadful situation we have at the moment, but it struck me this evening that the, um, the feeling, the surreal feeling is pretty similar. <clears throat> House of Recurring Dreams. And I'm going to read it, as, I suppose, as a sort of a welcome, to welcome you all into my little madhouse here this evening. House of Recurring Dreams. Come and stay in my house of cats, where the walls are whisper thin, the beds unmade, the doors unhinged, their scribbles in the dust. Spiders work the ceilings, the floorboards tend to speak, the eyes in all the photographs will blink when you're asleep. The stairs go up, but also down. Queen Cat will lick your hand. The TV wakes when no one's home. The windows all look out. The door is open. The door is closed. 
the address is here nor there. I'll serve you tea and pretend cake in my garden of thin air. I know this evening, uh, especially for Sandy, is a very special celebration of the anniversary of the Titanic. Um, I don't actually have any Titanic poem myself, but it, this is the nearest I got because I don't like boats very much, so I would never have gone in the Titanic. But this is a poem of my own about um, a boat journey uh, I went on uh, a few years ago. A much shorter journey. It, it, any of you who might have gone on the trip from Ross Castle and Killarney out to Fallon Island. So we're talking a little open, uh, smaller boat with an engine. Setting out. The unsteady sway of the boat as it moved across grey water had me gripping with both hands to the wooden seat. I watched the castle growing smaller until it was only a dark smudge receding into a widening view of water, shoreline, trees. And the fear left me on that stretch of open lake as a light breeze drew back my hair and the spray's touch was gentle as your fingers tracing the contours of my face. The boatman joked that he had drowned no one so far that morning. I thought of bones embraced by water, caressed by weeds, of swimmers who never made it home. Below me, I saw the face of a woman looking up from another world. I knew there were urgent stories she had come to tell, and I was all attention. Her face flashing past the boat in a continuous reel as we neared the island. I smiled down at her. In the shallows, she disappeared. With the engine cut, there was only the idle slabber of water against the boat. The knock, knock of wood and stone. I stepped out onto the pier like that first time, stepping into your arms, safer than anything I had known. Too many papers on my desk. I'm reading um, this this evening uh, mostly from this book, um, my most recent collection, The Narrow Way of Souls, uh, published by the amazing Jessie Lindini uh, and Salmon Poetry. And so a big shout out to Jessie and to Vaughan, Siobhan Hudson, the fabulous book designer, and to Eleanor in there who deals with all our queries and I'd like as well to thank Dermot McCarthy, um, a Killarney artist who kindly gave me permission to use a detail from one of his paintings um, as my cover. Uh, so um, it's, I suppose, it's good to support as well and that cross fertilization between artists and poets. Um, I'm going to stick, stay with the watery theme for a little while, but I'm moving on to some women who get really bad press. Uh, mermaids, sirens, uh, in Ireland they're called um, selkies, uh, and in Scotland more in Celtic mythology. Um, so this is a sort of mermaid poem. What she sings of. Once in a time he was the sky clothing me, the warm earth supporting me, the all in all of every night and day to me. 
He was salt waves washing me. He was wind caressing me, fire igniting me, the first and last of every cause that moved me. He was fish that jumped for me, beast, bird that sang for me, beast that nourished me, the craving and cure of every need inside of me. Now he is bright ship pulling away from me, white sail gone from me, his rough wake drowning me, he is shimmer of scales growing out of me. Soon I will sing to him, comb out my hair for him, draw him back to me, lure him down to me. Um, lots of us at this awful time are separated from people we care about here. I know um, lots of people can't see their grandchildren or can't see other family members. And I suppose we're all suffering in, in different ways. Um, some of us, of course, more than others with bigger losses. So maybe this is a kind of poem. Start on that theme, where you are. You lie down in whatever bed you lie down in, the pillow accepting the weight of your head, the mattress receiving your body like a longed for guest. You move in your sleep and the sheets react to your turnings. The blankets adjust, shaping themselves to your outline. The air in the room keeps time with your breathing, accepts being displaced, while I circle the walls of the city you dream. My papers are worn, frayed at the edges. That picture I have of myself, clouded over, and spotted with rain. My face is dissolving before me. The night holds you in sleep. You are stilled by its comforts, by the fabrics absorbing the sweat you expel. My cries go unheeded as I stand at the gate, pleading admittance. There is no one to turn to as you shed a layer of your skin while you lie there, dead to the world, my one reliable witness. I'll um, change the tone a little bit now. Um, I, I draw a lot of inspiration uh, from Irish folklore and folk tales Mainly, I, I think, because I grew up with all that sort of stories um, when I was a child in rural Kerry. I'm from here or, originally. Um, so, this... Ireland isn't the only place, of course, with folk tales because there's some very similar ones in America and actually across all cultures in the world. There's a lot of similar similarities between our... Um, ancient tales which is a wonderful point of reference and come a common point between us um now there's a lot of divination practiced in folk tales and a lot of it was to find your true love or to find riches or money but the woman in this poem had a much more practical reason for divination sexing the eggs as she had no use for a glut of cocks she filched the new-laid eggs from underneath the squawking fuss of hen, slipped from her pocket a wooden peg, threaded through with string. She held it still above each egg in turn until it told, through movement, what she was there to learn. 
clockwise circles marked an egg as female. A straight line back and forth condemned an egg as male. If the peg held firm, unmoving in the air, the egg was dead. She tossed the cocks and gluggers to the brace of hounds that waited eagerly outside. Their glossy coats and sparkling eyes were, were admired the parish wide. American culture, believe it or not, um, when I was growing up, it's, um, it reached our little village in a big way. My uncle, my mother's brother, lived in New York um, and he worked actually on cruise ships, which meant he had long stretches of time off then when he wasn't on, um, you know, on a, on a cruise. Um, he was never on the Titanic. Thank goodness. Um, he has come home to our house. Uh, that was his second home, really. And he has come every year uh, for extended times. And he brought us mad news of all sorts of things in New York, which we'd never heard of. And he used to cook all sorts of exotic foodstuffs for us. Um, I, I grew up in American country and Western music because he'd managed to bring all these LPs in his suitcase. And our house was always filled with music when he was around. Uh, and of course we had pictures of the Kennedys and all that sort of thing. And of course a worldwide um, hero from America was Muhammad Ali. And my mother was a great boxing fan. So this is a poem about Muhammad Ali, my mother, boxing and actually dementia. <clears throat> the greatest. She had no mass in boxing generally, but she loved Ali. In line with American time, she'd get out of bed to watch his bouts on the black and white telly, alert to his every movement, drawing every punch he drew cheering him on from our small kitchen with the range gone cold. Decades on, I chanced a ruse to rouse her from her vacant stare or maybe ascertain how far her memory had wound backwards on itself. I slipped in the video of four men I already knew the outcome. Coming in round eight, the defeats to follow in the interim. To her, the fight was in real time and I was a child again, watching my mother spring from her chair, declaring clay to be as pretty and as mouthy as she had ever seen. Showing no patience with his defensive ploys, she urged him to get off the ropes, to throw a decent punch, to dance. She talked it out, talked him up, talked him into winning. Her firm right hook landing flush on the jaw of her own invisible opponent. I'm going to finish with, um, I have no idea of my time, so I think I'm just about done. Um, so I'll finish with one short poem, and just before I read that, uh, thanks again to everybody, thanks to all the readers earlier tonight, it's been a fantastic evening. Thanks to Sandy, Beth and Dominic and Limerick. And of course to everyone who's watching in and commenting. Thank you. Um, 
I'll finish on this little poem, which is about something that none of us can do at the moment. No, it's not what you're thinking. Her running away money. A girl child can hide a small frog in her cupped fingers. Her best ribbon inside the pages of a book. A bird feather between pillow slip and pillow. A fallen egg in a nest of cotton wool. Her own self in the canopy under the firs. Her voice in a choir of bird song. Her thoughts in a spew of chatter. Big brown pennies down the slit in the mattress. The running away money that enables her to stay. Thank you very much and good night from Killarney. This is Anna Evans in New Jersey. Although uh, you can probably tell already I'm not from New Jersey originally. Um, thanks very much to Sandy for organizing this and stalking me on the internet to make me join. Uh, she did that because I wrote this uh, book, um, Under Dark Waters Surviving the Titanic, uh, which is actually, it was caused by my, the passing of my mother. She died in April and I couldn't approach it in poetry for a while. And then the following year, uh, I was um, uh, on social media and my feed filled up with posts about the Titanic. So I realized suddenly that I could approach my mother's death through the uh, lens of the Titanic disaster. Because this event is about the Titanic, I'm not really gonna read many of the poems that, uh, that mention my mother, but um, that's the genesis of the book if anyone wants to buy it. Okay, so with that, I shall get started. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is actually the first poem in the book. It's called Sister Ships. Uh, not many people know that the Titanic was actually one of a pair. Uh, and just for fun, this is also written as a mirror sonnet. What an experience, traveling on the Olympic. She is the flagship of the White Star Line. Compared to other ships, she looks gigantic, the epitome of luxury in design. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Many passengers are prominent in high society. She is a jewel. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich. It isn't quite so comfy in third class. And if by chance the voyage should hit a glitch, an iceberg say, nothing will come to pass. She is unsinkable, no need to fear. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. She is unsinkable. No need to fear an iceberg, say. Nothing will come to pass, even if the voyage should hit a glitch. It may not be so comfy in third class. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich in high society. She is a jewel. Many passengers are prominent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent, the epitome of luxury and design. Compared to other ships, she is gigantic, the perfect flagship of the White Star Line. What an experience traveling on the Titanic. So you probably noticed that I'm a formal poet and there's gonna be a fair amount of meter and rhyme here and some repetition. Here is a triolet, attempting the first six day crossing. And like many of the poems in the book, it has an epigraph. Captain E.J. Smith, ignored or discounted a total of seven iceberg warnings from other ships and his own crew. Under the stars this cloudless night, the sea lies smooth as a marble tomb that the ship cuts cleanly, all decks bright under the stars. This cloudless night, the iceberg looms like a work of spite by a god, contemptuous when men presume. Under the stars this cloudless night, the sea lies smooth as a marble tomb. Right, so uh, you've probably heard a lot about the band on board that uh, played on as the ship went down. And I've got a couple of sonnets about that in the book. The first one is actually called, and the band was playing ragtime because at the beginning they weren't playing the, uh, the, the somber music. So it has the epigraph, bandmaster Wallace Henry Hartley had assembled his men and the band was playing ragtime. 
Women and children first, the purser cries. The deck's tilt can no longer be ignored. Seeing the rigid faces, the wild eyes, Hartley gathers his boys and strikes a chord. Sweet syncopation rises in the air, jaunty rhythms that soothe the frightened crowd. Look, sings his violin, this is how men dare make tunes that break the rules and play them loud. The engines are silent now, so the music sways, doomed men in steerage who grin and tap their feet. Brave men who share a smoke as the octet plays, melodies pulsing with life in every beat. All know the cold, hard death they're about to face. In the end, courage is all about the bass. And then, of course, there is the poem about the, uh, the final song. It's actually called A Tune to Remember. Uh, the, it has the epigraph from Walter Lord's A Night to Remember, uh, the iconic book about the Titanic sinking. The legend is, of course, that the band went down playing nearer my God to thee. But if you look at the survivors' accounts, they are not all that consistent. Now that the boats have been lowered to the sea, now that the lights have failed and a deeper chill sets in among those remaining, the melody starts to sound frivolous in a night so still, so full of portent. Song sheets lit by stars, Hartley flips through, finds nothing with the power to be the last song, the one listed in memoirs by the exclusive survivors of this hour. And so he plays, by instinct or by ear, something that sounds a little like a hymn that he doesn't quite recall. The bandsmen hear, and by some miracle, they all join in, a tune never played before or heard again that unique night's unnameable refrain. Uh, so this poem is called Surviving the Titanic and there are a few poems in here about survivors. So I wanna read you one of those. They're quite interesting stories and they're all true. This one is Chief Baker, Charles Joffin and his whiskey. And uh, the reason that he survived, he was the only person who was actually pulled out of the water, which if you remember is like sub zero. And the reason he survived is because he was completely <coughs> drunk. And that's my dog. It has the epigraph. Maynard held out his hand and Joffin hung on, treading water, still thoroughly insulated. And it's a persona poem, so it's in the voice of the baker. I'd counted boats and knew there weren't enough. It seemed a fair assumption I would die. Well, I'm from Liverpool and pretty tough. No hero, just an ordinary guy. I helped them load the boats till they were full, threw deck chairs off for floating, just in case. And every now and then, I took a pull of whiskey I had hidden in my space. So, when Titanic dropped, I felt no pain. They say the water was a little cold. No worse than slogging through the Mersey rain, my veins on fire with all that liquid gold. For hours I paddled in the demon drink, Watched sober swimmers give up hope and sink. So uh, I actually invented a form called the haiku, which is a sequence of haiku that also reads as a pontoon. And there's one of those in this book. Obviously, uh, it's, it's partly this book is a commentary on the social order of the early 1900s, uh, because so many of the um, third class passengers died. And so this one is called Underclass, and it has the epigraph, Mary refused to be parted from John under the women and children first edict and was lost in the sinking. Black ice in my veins. I can't see my husband, John, the man I stayed with. Sleep pulls me under. I can't see John, my husband. Someone's crying out. Sleep pulls me under beneath the water again. Someone's crying out, in the name of God, beneath the water again, my mouth full of brine. In the name of God, can anybody hear us? My mouth full of brine, freezing bitter tears. Can anybody hear us? The boats are far off. Freezing bitter tears cannot summon them near us. The boats so far off. The man I stayed with cannot summon them near us. Black ice in my veins. 
So um, the longest poem in the book is a Sestina. It's called The Lord's Prayer on, uh, Prayer on Collapsible Bee. And this is also a true story in that they sent out a boat, uh, one of the lifeboats that was actually a collapsible lifeboat and it got sent out upside down. And nevertheless, there were a bunch of people who were basically on the upturned boat trying to survive. And uh, so the, the, um, the myth is that they said the Lord's Prayer or the, whatever the legend is, the memoirs say, and so I used as the repetends for the Sestina, six words from the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer on Collapsible B. Someone said, don't you think we ought to pray? And so we went around and each man named the religion that he followed here on earth. I'm a Presbyterian like my father, but I'd have prayed to any God to deliver us right then and after sought forgiveness. When facing death, Men need to feel forgiven, and even the ungodly turn to prayer. On the upturned boat, we had scant hope of delivery. I thought of my wife and children, whispered their names, and then we agreed. We should all say the Our Father and hope for a better place beyond this earth. My God, I yearn to be back on solid earth, more than I wanted my many sins forgiven. I wanted to hear my young son call out, Father, and gather my family together in simple prayer. Still, one man there, I do not know his name, took a deep breath and commenced at once to deliver the Lord's prayer, the one that prays for him to deliver us from evil, that his will be done on earth. I almost laughed to think this happened in his name, some sinner perhaps on the ship he couldn't forgive. Anyway, I mumbled the well-known prayer. All of us, shivering, repeated the Our Father. A young boy whimpered that he had lost his father, the screams of the drowning faded beyond deliverance, and still a dozen or more of us said the prayer known since childhood to so many people on earth. Forgive us, I said to the dying. Please forgive me as I forgive you, and mentioned people by name. Finally, a whistle and a dark shape, asking to name who was in charge. I said the name of my father uneasily, aware that there could be no forgiveness even if by some miracle we were delivered. I knew I'd spend the rest of my days on earth thinking of those who did not have a prayer, nor would I ever name my most honest prayer. Our Father, for our hubris on this earth, forgive your children and, O oh Lord, deliver us. So the next poem is actually one of my favorite ones in the book. Uh, it's an abecedarian, which is where you start each line with the letter of the alphabet going all the way through. And of course, it gets pretty tricky toward the end, but you'll see what I did with that. Anyway, this is also a true story. Every uh, line is actually a story that I researched, and uh, it's also an, another of the ones that is a bit of a commentary on how they ran the loading of the lifeboats. Animals of the Titanic. Asta's Airedale Kitty perished along with her owner. Ben, Captain Smith's Irish wolfhound, put ashore in Southampton. Chow Chow, left behind by Harry Anderson, drowned. Dog, a fox terrier, last seen swimming. English foxhounds 100 booked on alternate passage. Fru Fru, detached from her grip on Helen Bishop's gown, perished. Gamine de Picon, prize-winning French bulldog, drowned. Hens and roosters, caged, drowned. Isham, Anne Elizabeth and her Great Dane, bodies recovered together. Jenny, Chip's mouser, drowned. Kittens of Jenny, likewise. Lady, Pomeranian of first-class passenger Margaret Hayes, survived. Mice and rats, free living, drowned. Newfoundland wriggle, survivor and hero, apocryphal. Objections raised to the three boat, the dogs on the lifeboats? None. Pomeranian, belonging to Elizabeth Rothschild, survived. Quote, I refuse to get on the lifeboat without my dog. Rothschild Martin, body never recovered. Sun Yat-sen, Pekingese of Henry Sleeper Harper, survived. 
terrier and spaniel of the Philadelphia Carters perished. Unconscionable, the 56 children left out of the lifeboats. Vacancies on the lifeboats, 40%. Wealthy survivors, 200 plus three dogs, and XYZ and XYZ and XYZ. All right, like many of you, I'm gonna finish with a more positive poem because maybe that's what we need in these times. And also it is called Surviving the Titanic. And finally, another good reason for reading this poem is that my daughter is putting this on Instagram and this is a poem that features her. So to say thank you, here is my villanelle on visiting the Titanic exhibition in Vegas with my teenage daughters, which has the epigraph, I am the king of the world from James Cameron's Titanic. Trust me, I say, you're going to be enthralled. Curious, they wander toward the model ship. They are the undisputed queens of the world. The bills of lading, the lists of people killed aren't that exciting to them. I bite my lip. Trust me, I'd said, you're going to be enthralled. But then we enter a room that's kept so cold the genuine iceberg loses barely a drip. They are the undisputed queens of the world. And next, a chamber where a swathe of the hold brought from the seabed is set up, a vertical strip. Trust me, I'd said, I think they are enthralled. Of course, there's a place where the movie set's installed. From the famous scene, oh, this won't be cheap, I quip. But they are the undisputed queens of the world. My youngest stands at the bow, her arms unfurled, her sister steadies her, one hand upon her hip. Trust me, she says, I can only watch, enthralled. They are the undisputed queens of the world. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you again to Sandy and all the wonderful Irish poets that I was able to listen to a few of. Here's the book, Under Dark Waters, Surviving the Titanic. You can get it from my website or Able Muse Press. And thank you all for listening. Good night.